shifted way would be that we use AI and recommender systems to produce two sides of the coin. So if you are going to produce like 10 recommendations for, for YouTube clips to watch, that should be um, designed so it, it always shows both sides of the coin. If you have a thing like anti-vax, if you have a thing like uh, other things, then if you design the system to always make sure you have a 50-50 or at least um, an objective balance between both sides of whatever topic, then AI and personalization could actually help reduce the filter bubble. But then would you, would you need to put that into regulation or would you think you, yeah, who, perhaps, who, who, but, but would, who would drive it yeah, in this way? Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. But, but would you agree with that? It, that increased AI, increased like personalization can actually lead to a reduction in filter bubble if you design it correctly. I mean, I had that experience with YouTube. I was like hooked on YouTube. Mm. And then what I did is like, I, I figured out I'm losing way too much time in this. Mm. So I did just disabled all the options where they can keep track of my history. Yeah. And then now I, I still see all the all the programs that I that I like, mm. but I don't get this flood of recommendations. I mean, the recommendations that I get are terrible. Mm. So I just watch the things that I, I chose to watch. Is that the right solution then? I mean, to get terrible recommendations mean you potentially spend less time, which potentially have some other positive side effects, but don't you think you could get good recommendations and still escape the filter bubble if you were to design it correctly? Yeah, maybe. I, I remember there was like maybe 10 years ago, there was this service that tried to uh, break the filter bubbles. Mm. It, uh, was it prismatic or something? They had as their idea to to give you like, yes, your own personalized news, but also from the larger circle mm. of friends and like the whole world or something. But. I guess it didn't work so well because they're not around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I've listened to a number of like YouTube recommender data scientists, and, and I know they at least had a couple of years ago that in their plans to do provide like um, an objective balance of whatever topic they they speak about. So I, I know, and and diversity. I, I think originally they had like three uh, metrics which they rank the recommendations by one is like novelty you know the newer the better another is relevance which is basically how related is is it to whatever you searched for or your what your interests are and thirdly it's actually diversity so it should be a set of recommendations that differ from each other you don't want to get recommended the exact same thing all the time you want to have a set of diverse recommendations but i think you could add on top of that also having like different views to, to diversity in another way, if you see what I mean. Mm. But if you were to do that, don't you think it's possible to have a more objective recommendations without reducing uh, like information that you provide to it, like turning off cookies or trying to reduce the data that they can collect about you, so to speak? Or am I too optimistic here? I would, do, I would propose the opposite. So uh, propose tools to let you protect yourself. So the, the companies have no incentives to do this, right? Uh, yes, uh, they, I, I mean, would argue they do. They, but, but the more they recommend uh, what you want to see, maybe not what you need to see, but what mm. you want to see, the more you're going to see it. So, I mean, it's like giving candy to a toddler. I mean, they're always okay, going to... Let me, let me argue on that <laughs> point, because I think it's a very interesting point. And, and, um, you know, some people claim that Facebook, for example, recommends stuff that you get angry with mm -hmm. over things that you like because you engage more in that and you potentially comment more on that. And potentially, if you were to recommend things that you don't completely agree with, that could actually increase engagement. I think the other, you know, the, the true reason is really that tech companies want to have a long term engagement of users. If people feel that they just get, you know, too hung up with listening to the same thing all the time and don't get an objective view, you will basically turn off, which you basically said yourself, mm. you will stop using the service. So the long term objective would be really bad if the, you know, whatever tech company don't optimize for that. But I mean, they do have like a gazillion users. So yeah. all of those people 
and they've been there for a long time. So all yeah, of those people. Still, I, I don't think any tech company is optimizing for short term like engagement. It should be long term engagement that they are all focused on. But and that's I know what, but that's that, what the the stockholders want. They want like no, short term gains. No, 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 no. no? I don't agree I, with I, you I, on I this. Sh- I'm, I remember even from the Spotify days, anyone that optimized for short-term gains, they, they would com- be completely mm. out of the game. There's so, no but, way that so, they, that's so would be their gains. We're talking about uh, you know, metrics like uh, lifetime value of the customer, and yeah. we're talking about metrics on, on how long you stay on, how many hours or how, how long is your periods of, of this. And, 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 and customer lifetime value, you could argue, is the long game. But the metric around, you know, how much are you binging at any point in time? That that is fairly short short term, I, I think. So, and that's clearly a metric. You know, I, I take the example of LinkedIn. You know, when you when you post something on, on LinkedIn, the algorithm clearly doesn't want you to link to Medium or a YouTube clip. They prefer you to link mm-hmm. to something that gets you to stay inside the LinkedIn platform. So you know, so the algorithms are clearly, you know, favoring things that. St- you stay on the platform. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a tricky one, yeah? And, and um, But if we make an hypothesis, assume the tech companies do focus on long-term user experience, not short-term user experience, then they should try to also make people be able to escape the filter bubble. Would you agree with that, at least? And, uh, it boils down to uh, maybe what you were onto before, do we want to? You know, do, 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 do people really want to? I, I think I want to, but in general, it's quite a comfort zone. <laughs> but what if, what if, like, I like what, what YouTube did, that they gave me the control over whether, uh, whether I, uh, how much they can recommend to me. Now, I would like to have, like, a, a dial, because, mm. I mean, clearly I went, mm. it's binary now. Yeah. But I, I thought, like, it would be nice binary to... Binary in what way? Binary That you either on. turn off uh, your information and turn it on. So oh, oh, you mean <coughs> in terms of how much personal information yeah. you share with them? And or these are and these are let's call it good companies, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, if, from a personal point of view, I would like to have like an AI that watches random YouTube videos all day and listens to random music and random web pages all day, and then the, hopefully the, the the phone won't be able to tell when I'm using the phone or when the AI is using the phone. <laughs> and then that way you can't recommend anything. So that, that would be the ideal for me so that I can, I can just have a dial, like how much information I want to share with whoever is listening on the other side. Uh, but, mm, uh, mm, yeah. but do you think but it's going to go in that direction? Would you like to have randomized ads? If, if, if you're forced to every 10th whatever kind of clip or song or whatever, would you prefer to have completely randomized ads or something that adds ads that are actually relevant for you? I've never clicked on an ad on internet, ever. Like, okay. I want no ads. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think I pay my Spotify subscription? It was just to avoid the freaking ads. <laughs> Those are horrible. Yeah. Do you see a f- future that ads actually could add value to a user experience? I know that Google, you know, it's been there, you know. You need to make for. better ads. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I looked up the, the, the Super Bowl ads on yeah. every, every, I don't watch football, but I will download the, the Super Bowl ads yeah. uh, on, on YouTube because they're fun. Yeah. Why can't you create fun uh, thing that, you know, makes my life? Uh, Do you think that there is a future for the ad supported or ad financed type of services that we all have in use today? Or should we all switch to subscription services? Hmm. I'm the same as Alex. I never click. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, I'm kind of. Would you prefer to have a subscription option in, in Google search? No, not personally. I'm pretty good at ignoring the ads. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit optimistic, I think, about, you know, I've been working in the ad business as well at some point far back in the future, but I think there is a time and a possibility that ads actually can add value for you. Um, it's not that good at uh, as organic results, but if they are, uh, have the proper intelligence and purpose, I think actually actually could add value as well. I mean, we're moving more into the influencer ads. So that's uh, somebody uh, that, let's say, you trust, mm-hmm. right, and that knows what they're talking about. So it, it kind of mm-hmm. 
I mean, I know that half of them are scams and they're paid to mm. say whatever you pay them to say. But I mean, let's. I I have fallen uh, victim to buying something that somebody that I listen on a podcast yeah. uh, says like, oh, I tried this yeah. shaver and it's very <laughs> nice. So I, mm. there, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I would like to have a better shaver. Yeah, but I'll buy that. Mm. You know, so things yeah, like that I, I think works. Be, but the, there's, there's a person that is giving value to the ad. It's not just some ad company making up lies. So the, the thing is that there's no, I don't trust anything that ads say because the end of publicity. Uh, would you trust something that an AI says to you that this ad may be interesting for you? Perhaps mm. you need to buy diapers because uh, your kid is <laughs> suddenly pregnant as the Google <laughs> thing was. <laughs> But uh, Alexander Bard, a cyber philosopher in Sweden, mm. he has been talking a, lo a, a lot about this and, you know, Uh, you know, uh, internet marketing doesn't work. It, we, we need to go to internet communication. And he, he highlights that, you know, the new metrics is sort of, you know, you know, attention is a, is a combination of um, uh, relevance and reach. So what, I, what, what his argument is that it's simply too much noise now and, and, and that basically no one listens to any messages or take in any messages if it doesn't come from a source that you have a relationship to. So this is you know, one story. You know, the first generation of this is the influencer. You know, we, we start to understand and get jaded on the influencer recommendation now, I think. But I think th there's, a, there's a point here in this super mega noise, right? And we go into metaverse time now. Uh, you know, th th how you build brands, how you build relationships in order for, you, you know, so it's it more or less, there's no point for you to scream out, pushing out your message. You need to create pull around your message. You need, to, you need to build relationships or connections. You need to have content that is relevant and of value. And then you need to have reach because it's good content and then they will listen and then, and, you know, so, so what does ads leave you in this type of context? I, you know, this is something very different in my opinion. I, you know, less push oriented, more how to create pull. And, and what is that type of communication? I mean, Tesla never invests in, in marketing. They're the most expensive car company in the okay, world. So I think touche, right? They, they, they are all about pull. Yeah. We, we, follow, uh, we follow Elon Musk and what he's tweet, tweeting about. And, you know, he got so much... So he doesn't push market in that sense. We, yeah, he, he that's a completely different thing because he gets shitload of money for selling each car. So they have a completely different you know business model no, compared but, uh, to like uh, Facebook or Google search or whatever. So there's two different things. No, but the, the companies who are now investing in advertising, you know, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Google and Facebook and search, how effective is it truly in in five to ten years you know you know what is will people you know you you sit here we don't click we don't mm. really click do we uh, I, i i flip it i click when i see something from a brand or from a friend that i trust you know something that has meaning and value to me beforehand i'm inclined to look at if it just comes over me You know, okay, then maybe the AI story, then I ca I'm, I'm in the search for something now. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the mood to buy new boots, right? Yeah. So when boots ad appeals to me right now, maybe yeah. that's one, I one way. I on as well. I bought like sh church and whatnot, you know, on ads. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's been sometimes useful for me. Yeah. Okay, should we just circle back you know, to what this uh, <laughs> discussion started with? Um, and that was, I guess, um, the filter bubble of people and anti-vax versus people that do get vaccinated, you know, and, and you spoke about Hong Kong as well. And, and what was that about Hong Kong again, Mikael, uh, that you mentioned? Yeah, so basically there is a big surge now in, in uh, coronavirus mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. So over here with, I mean, the pandemic is for all practical purposes sort of a bit forgotten also, yeah. also due to the, the war in Ukraine, but in the other pandemic continues. Yeah, in other parts of the world. And Hong Kong has basically been suppressing it successfully for over two years. And now suddenly Omicron has hit really hard and they have, I think, the largest um, sort of in fastest increase in cases and deaths that anyone has ever had. And almost oh, really? 5,000 people died in the past weeks. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus. 250 people per day, Jesus. which is a lot. So that's, 
yeah, really surprising and, and scary. And you also, Alex, mentioned that uh, you also had some acquaintances that, that were still, even though you're a pro-vaccine, you, you had some acquaintances that had anti-vaccine interests or thoughts, right? Not acquaintances, my fa- half of my family. <laughs> <laughs> I you don't know how tense the, the, the Christmas was. <laughs> yeah. you know? I didn't want to say that, but I'm uh, glad that you said it. But no, yeah. it's... Uh, yeah, it's 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 really hard, and and they are they are uh, they are good people. They're intelligent people. They mm-hmm. are just as passionate, uh, and they they believe that these things are are bad. And yeah. and why would you give this to to your kids? And and now they're in Costa Rica. They are forcing people to vaccinate the kids, and that's mm-hmm. that really sparked the um, the fire in, in in my family, right? Because if you believe that this is bad for you mm. and the government forces you to do that then you're going to have a problem i would have the same the, the same reaction if i believed that the vaccines were were uh, damaging my 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 kids and then so. here and here we come to the filter bubble so how can we have very super intelligent people thinking so differently pro or anti and we concluded somewhere it's it's very much in the context of the ecosystem and the culture and, and what uh, what is the main message in your ecosystem that is being megaphoned out that probably impacts a lot on how we think in these matters. Right. Was that correct? Oh, come, come again. No, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, why, how, you know, we have intelligent people on the one hand side, they are pro vaccine and we have intelligent people uh, against vaccines. And why is that? And, and I think we concluded somewhere it has a lot to do with your, what is the main message and in, in your eco- ecosystem where you, you know, it's your, your your news diet basically. Your news diet. It's yeah. it's, yeah, it's yeah, where exactly. you get. I mean, you get like a certain set of news. Uh, I mean that uh, that says that vaccines are like this God given uh, gift that is going that that saves a lot of people. And then on the other side, what they hear is this is a a, 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 a poison that is going to you know damage your lungs. And I mean the the amount of things that that they have crazy. is just crazy. But uh, but I mean they, they they believe that you know they, and they keep uh, getting the same messages over and over and over again every day they keep hearing the same things vaccines are bad vaccines are bad so why wouldn't you uh, believe that and the algorithm cuts off all the the things that are that are not related to you and it it kind of the solution converges into a more and more and more um, uh, how do you call it, reactionary uh, group of people. So you, you reinforce itself. And uh, there, is, there, is this, uh, there is this study that they did on, how was this, that, you know, uh, the, this um, George, was it George Orwell that, that once uh, made this radio show that pretended that the yeah. aliens were coming. Yeah, I think. And, and uh, like recently some <laughs> master student went through the trouble of, of figuring out where was there panic and where was there no panic? And uh, I mean, long story short, uh, if you were around a lot of people that were watching the same news, then you actually believed that. But if you were alone watching the same news, you're not going to believe that. So it comes down that by built in, there's a biological circuit that says, if you hear the same thing many, many times, you're going to believe that that is true, Mm. right? And uh, but if you hear it from one one person, it doesn't matter if he's an expert. If you just hear it once, so it's not quality; it's quantity. That's how we're built biologically. So I think that that has a lot to do with this. It's, it doesn't matter if you get a Nobel Peace Prize saying like vaccines are good. If you hear uh, some YouTuber say it five thousand times, that's going to be much more weight in your brain than the the, the Nobel Prize winner, and it, that's what it comes down to. Just a, a comment. I think it was Orson Welles. Orson yeah, Welles. Yeah. Orson Welles. Thank you. Yeah. The, the War of the Worlds uh, in April Fool's Day or something like this. Yeah. yeah it was a very interesting. Uh, so, and basically, a reinforced message um, have the power to convince more or less anyone to believe in some topic. Right. Yeah. What was it? The Hitler said, "Lie, lie, something will stay." Right. Uh, I haven't heard that. Uh, maybe I, I haven't heard. But it, maybe um, I, I just want to share. I, I saw a, a LinkedIn comment of someone, um, a, a Russian person. So this is uh, in connection to the war, who basically was putting out a message in, in that we need to help 
our friends in Russia by basically, you know, if we have friends and connections that live somewhere in Russia, you need to talk to them now. You need to chat with them. You need to email them. You need to explain and, and, and convey the story that you hear because they are not hearing the same story and they're not understanding the situation in, mm. in at all the same way. If you're a normal Russian person in the street who is sort of getting, you know, one very clear, you know, filter bubble, so to mm. speak. So I think that is also a quite interesting example, right? So that if you want to break a filter bubble, you, you, you kind of need to go to, have you got relations, you have trust in some way, and then you need to get messages from completely different places. So I think this topic is quite quite um, disturbing <laughs> in, in many ways. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people are too easily fooled sometimes. And, we, and I think we should be humble that we all yeah. are. Yeah. That we all are. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone. Anyone, yeah. sure. Awesome. Um, great to have you here, Mikael Hus and Alex uh, Fernandez. Mm -hmm. Mikael, uh, you and me have known each other for a long time. Not really sure how long, but it was before the Peltorian days, right? It was... Uh, some yeah, I mean, I we, we met at at some meetups before yeah. that, like maybe Stockholm Big Data and right. and, and your machine learning yeah. meetups. Yeah, so maybe ten years. <laughs> yeah, <it> could be. <laughs> well, um, I I do have a lot of admir uh, admiration for, for you, and, and you're a person I respect a lot. I know you're you know knowledgeable person in, in both data science and bioinformatics. Um, I don't know you, you yet, Alex, but I've heard <laughs> you have the same type of background. So very much looking forward to hearing more from from you as well. And I mean, Mikael, you have like a number of like nature publications and whatnot. So you know, who couldn't be you know, <laughs> having a, a huge respect for your knowledge and your skills? So with that, you know, it's a true pleasure to have you here, both the founders of Codon Company. And uh, yeah, with that, you know, should we start with perhaps you, Mikael? If, if mm. you were to just try to describe a bit more about yourself, you know, who, who is Mikael Hus? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the nice intro. <laughs> also, have a lot of uh, respect for you, Anders. Um, well, who who am I? Short story or long <laughs> or long <laughs> story? No, but I guess like I've been I've been interested in, in in sort of AI, machine learning, and biology as well since high school. So I was playing around with like trying to program some genetic algorithms and um, you know some primitive neural networks mm -hmm. um, at so that, that time. Was, uh, five years ago approximately <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that, that was a long time ago <laughs> uh, but then I'm also quite interested in languages mm -hmm. so I had a hard time kind of choosing what I should study so of course then I did both <laughs> So I studied uh, molecular biotechnology engineering in Uppsala, but then I also studied Chinese. Right. So I lived uh, for a while in China, and um, and I got two degrees. And uh, you know, within this molecular biotechnology engineering program, I discovered that, well, number one, I wasn't very good in the lab. <laughs> number two, um, the wet work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, number two there was this thing called bioinformatics where you could do mm. biology on computers. I was like, yay! <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also we had a course called uh, Pattern Recognition, which sort of blew me away. Like, wow, this is, this is interesting. So basically what we call, I guess, machine learning now, but, but in, a, in a bit yeah, earlier form. It's more data mining type of, or was it called actually pattern recognition? Yeah, the course was called okay. pattern recognition. So mm -hmm. it was like things like um, principal component analysis and um, like uh, k-means clustering and yeah, yeah. So stuff like <laughs> that. Uh, so then I ended up doing my master's thesis at a company called Virtual Genetics, mm -hmm. which was around so this is like 20 years ago so <laughs> um, they were quite early in applying machine learning and uh, uh, NLP we called it information retrieval mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah that was that was really fun we were doing but yeah. if we just you know I think it's nice to just 
try to have a clear understanding of what different terms mean. So information yeah. retrieval for me, and please correct me if you disagree, is more of the search engine type of use case where you try to map like some kind of query to a set of documents and then you have information extraction and NLP can be so many other things as well. Or what do you mean with information retrieval? I know like yeah. music information retrieval is not really like text information retrieval and it's such, such a confusion I think sometimes with the th terminology here. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, I think we were talking about information retrieval in that company because it was partly uh, started by search engine oh, specialists. Okay. I see. And then we have these like textbooks about information retrieval. Yeah. But they contain things about like uh, TFIDF, you know, yeah, the way yeah. to rank uh, terms and, and search. And, and we did... Um, some, yeah, we, we had a search engine mm -hmm. and then we did like similarity search, pretty primitive compared to what you can do today, but, <laughs> mm -hmm. and trying to come up with ways to flag or like find keywords in medical abstracts. So we were analyzing oh. medical so abstracts. So it wasn't genetics in any way, it was truly text at that point as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and then there was like another arm of the company that made a platform for uh, machine learning on molecule fragments, like predicting what activity they would have. And we were using basically uh, ensemble algorithms, mm. boosting and bagging. What do you think about ensemble algorithms? I guess you know what I think, but what do you think <laughs> about them? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to lead you here to an answer, but still. Okay, I, yeah, I don't know if I... If I ever have thought in those terms, yeah. if I think, I no, but skip I, the question. Yeah. <laughs> but I, no, but I, 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 uh, I, I use uh, gradient boosting mm -hmm. quite a lot. So I mean, that's a good one. I, I wouldn't call that an ensemble, but still, yeah, ah, okay. I see what you mean. <laughs> what is ensemble? Yeah, so in my term, I mean, everyone that wants to win a Kaggle competition basically resort to an ensemble algorithm that combines like 10, 15 different algorithms together and just take the average of, of them and, or some kind of um, pooling of them. And in that way, they, they find an incredibly complicated solution to something that actually beats something, like the Netflix, Netflix price, you know, f for, for ranking as well. That was a super comp complicated algorithm that was not really ingenious in the way that they designed it. It's just like a very brute force, huge set of algorithms that together can actually have a really well working performance, but it's impossible to implement and nothing of course that Netflix ever chose to put in production because it, it, it wouldn't work for practical purposes. So, so I, I, I observe it's an, the ugly way to, to make something work without understanding anything. So for, for in layman's terms, uh, getting to brute force by having many different algorithms ensembled as one, I don't know, combined. If you algorithm. don't know how to do it properly, then resort to ensemble <laughs> algorithms. Yeah, can, I, be. can I object yes. to that? I hopefully. like it. No, <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go. So let me call you on that. Is in your brain an, an ensemble? Ah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm so stupid. So that's fine. <laughs> We no, because I mean, the, the neural cortex has going to have a different architecture than the visual cortex that the medulla, yeah, well, yeah. The, you know, mm -hmm. all those, mm -hmm. all those weird words. But yeah. I, I, if I remember something from those days, it was that different parts of the brain are, are connected in a very particular mm -hmm. way and that gives them different abilities. So, yeah. I mean, to me, I think that the brain is, is an ensemble algorithm, not done uh, randomly. Okay, yeah. I grant you that, but an ensemble. Well, let me just, okay, this is an interesting topic. Perhaps <laughs> we should have a separate topic for this. But <laughs> if we take like, you know, one of the algorithm, algorithms I hate, which is GPT-3, uh, not because I do love the way they could make that work. Uh, I just dislike what people think about it and think it's actually something mm -hmm. of practical use. But it, it, I think what I do love about it is that it's a super, super simple idea. A single objective of just predicting the next word that seems to emerge into something that can do so many different things, so many different tasks. It's just by scaling up both the model and the data it's trained on, you can do so many things. So in that sense, I would say it's not an ensemble because it's a single objective that is training everything. 
whereas an ensemble, and, and that's the same for the human brain then. So the human brain is also having these kind of synapses and I'm moving into your speciality here, so I'm going out on a limb, but... <laughs> yeah. Tread carefully. <laughs> Tread carefully. <laughs> well, I love that, this. It's going to be fun. Do you see the point here? That, you know, even though the human brain has so many different you know, areas in the brain that are good at diff different things and, and you can have connections from wherever it can be, the same you could argue for a big neural network. If it's still trained with a single objective that can be routed to every, anything, it's still a very simple and single way to train it. And an ensemble is the opposite, that you have different objectives, different ways to train something um, compared to, to the single objective. You see my yeah, point? Uh, yeah, but I, th I see it as a technicality, like, that, well, okay, you you have a different training training uh, algorithm for different uh, models. But but the, the more manual, hard-coded, inductive priors that you add to the mm -hmm. algorithms, the worse it is. Yeah. So in that sense, the, the brain had have some, you know, genetic priors, of course, in it, but an, an ensemble algorithm have a huge number of priors that you manually put into it, and that makes it ugly. That is also what like makes GPT still beautiful because it's a very simple prior. Just predict the next word that you train on. But it, but the, the main thing you 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 are getting hooked up now, and you you're sort of uh, putting up, a, you know, a rant. To be honest, <laughs> <An> important discussion. <laughs> it's not no, a it's rant. a rant. It's no. a rant. No. The rant you have right now is that it's it has you know. Mm, limited usefulness in production because you know but that's to a different topic but i think is, is that what the rant is all no, about no it's not i think the ensemble versus not ensemble i think that's the 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 core question here and i would argue that the human brain is not that much of an ensemble but i can see your point it partly is but why, 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 why do you put the rant up to oh i don't like ensembles you know what i think about ensembles you because know it's, it's so much manual coding into it it's, it's not you know you don't know what to do so you put in you know 15 different algorithms and then you just take the average of them and then that is not like something that can be as cleanly defined as just predicting the next word but it's a simple objective and what's the problem with that isn't isn't that that you know to it's keep not a scalable that solution exactly it, so the problem with that is usefulness production maintainability yeah. scalability yeah mm. uh, just to be clear like the Ensemble methods that I mentioned that that triggered this, they are <laughs> decision tree ensembles. Ah, okay. So it's it's the same. Then it's the same it's objective. It's it's the same same same. So now it's a nice <laughs> ensemble. Nice. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a sem semi ensemble. It's a good, good ensemble. <laughs> a good ensemble. Yes. Oh, okay. so, yeah. the, and in those days, it was bagging and boosting, and yeah. then random yeah. forest, and then gradient, gradient boosting. Boost. But yeah, I'm, I think both Brandon Forrest and, and Gradient Boosting are beautiful algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> what I don't like is, is when you combine, you know, a large yeah. number of rule-based versus learned versus like decision trees versus neural network versus genetic algorithms versus whatever. And you just do that and then take the average and you have no clue really how to design it. You just try it out and you don't know what you're doing. Mm. That is more my Rant. That's your <laughs> rant. <laughs> Let's get out of this hole. <laughs> okay. Anyway, getting yeah. back to, or yeah, would you agree, by the way, or do you see some problem with the ugly part of uh, ensemble? Yeah, I don't, I don't really use those kinds of models either. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't. <laughs> okay, so. cool. Getting back to... Okay, we spoke about uh, virtual genetic, genetics, right? Yeah, so exactly. That? And then you had information retrieval. You want to find things from uh, medical abstract, right? And information yeah. retrieval techniques at that time. Yeah. So that was a nice uh, intro. Mm -hmm. And and then, uh, yeah, the IT bubble burst mm -hmm. and also... I had a colleague there who was a, um, uh, uh, what's it called, like an industrial PhD student. So he was both at Karolinska Institute and at Virtual Genetics, and he was doing such nice and fun projects. So it seemed, oh, doing a PhD seems like a nice thing. So maybe I should try to do that now that this company seems to be 
going south. <laughs> oh, so that's what the reason you pursued a PhD, that yeah. you could see the IT bubble bursting and then yeah. you jumped into academia. Yeah, then I, I, I have this friend who was, uh, who was doing this, and he, he's now a professor at KI, by the way. Mm -hmm. But um, then I did a PhD at uh, KTH, mm -hmm. and yeah, that's also a whole whole story that we don't need to go into because I I was supposed to do one thing, but then it became something completely different. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that completely different thing was um, to model biological neural networks, not mm -hmm. artificial neural networks, but like actual neural networks in the spinal cord of uh, Lamprey. Nejonöga uh, in Swedish, which is like an eel-like vertebrate fish that um, is like so the type of an animal, uh, yeah, a fish. Yeah, it's considered the T Ford of locomotion research because it's <laughs> the simplest organism that we have still alive, like that still uh, exists, exists. So from the really original, ur, uh, what do you call it in? One of the original uh, type um, locomotive yeah. animals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like the most primitive animal that has uh, survived. Uh, yeah, that, that has a, a spinal cord. So it could be like a yeah a T Ford. It should be the <laughs> simplest model system, but it's still pretty darn difficult <laughs> to analyze. <laughs> and so you try to simulate that or what? Yeah, uh, try to simulate how it how it swims and different aspects of that and. I mean, a lot of people had. Th it was a whole, whole big uh, research group that did that. So, and, and what is the promise of working with the biological neural networks? What what is the opportunity or use cases that is appealing with this? One thing is simply understanding how it works, but uh, like th I think the the best application is to is to treat spinal cord injuries. Like try to use that knowledge to, uh, yeah, to to help people who had spinal cord injuries. But um, my research was very far from that. It was more basic basic research. Yeah. Cool. And I think we need to you know move a bit faster because yeah. we need to cover Alex <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. as well. And then we have a large number of professional topics to to cover. That, let's let's try to break the trend of yeah. having an introduction for one hour <laughs> and then a yeah, presentation half for half an <laughs> yeah. hour. Okay, but you went into the PhD. Is, is that something you still are, you know, happy with, um, or do you think you could have? Would you do a PhD again if you were to go back to that time? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I didn't think so during the PhD because it was very hard and <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah, it's uh, a lot of desperation when you try to write <laughs> your papers and stuff yeah. like that. But. But I'm still quite happy in in retrospect. You're a better person for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so. a nice experience to to go through. I think. Yeah. Once you actually gone through it, at least, right? Yeah, I mean, you you learn a lot about your your yourself and how you react to. Would you agree also that the PhD is more about the journey to actually learn how to do science rather than the subject that you potentially have learned? Yeah, I would say so. Actually, it's uh, about learning learning how to do science. Yeah. Awesome. What happened after the PhD? Yeah, so then I went to Singapore to do a postdoc mm -hmm. and uh, switched fields again. Uh, I, uh, yeah, you could say I, I went back to where I somehow started in, in bioinformatics. Uh, but at that time, there had been a big revolution in DNA sequencing. So they had all of these shiny new... Mm -hmm. instruments that were <laughs> churning out data and people didn't really know what to what to do with it so that was kind of fun because we were involved in just figuring out like, what 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 should we do with it how should we analyze it and so, um, yeah so these are quite a few years before the big gene sequencing breakthroughs that we've had lately in the last couple of years i guess 
Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're. <laughs> no, no, I think to there's, there's been a lot of. Uh, I mean, even yeah. at that time, I think they had a number of breakthroughs. You had right? a number of breakthroughs already then, but uh, I, uh, I, I don't know this. I'm, t- I'm talking the. You speak to experts here in. Uh, yeah, I know. So I was trying to understand, uh, you know, what what this was all about versus. W- I don't even know the correct. N- we're talking about the. Yeah. M- no. So. Metaphor or I, mean, I, I can't even say it correctly. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then I then I understand what. You mean, well, I mean, there was a project that took about 10 years uh, in the 90s mm. about sequencing the first human genome. So it took 10 years and cost, what, like 3 billion? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Uh, but then after 2007, with these new instruments, it went dramatically down. And now you can sequence a genome for like, I don't know, a couple of hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. A hundred dollars. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it's, do you know the, the Moore's law? Yeah. Well, sequencing is like Moore's law exponential. Exponential. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's insane. It's insane, right? It's cheaper to sequence a tumor than to take a picture of it with an MRI machine. That's yes. Yeah, this is so so insane. And and of course now in the vaccine development and how we have seen that with COVID, of course, it came to practice in in a very yeah. concrete ways how modern and mm-hmm. you know what they could do. Exactly. How yeah. fast? How fast? Awesome. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, Singapore is a nice city, right? Mm, Surprisingly, yeah. uh, or h- how would you describe Singapore as a city? Well, it's a very livable city, quite well ordered. Um, and but yeah. they have severe fines, right, if you do something bad. Right? <laughs> Spit. <laughs> yeah, I, I never got to pay any of those. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, there are. The, the, there are rules for sort of uh, drinking water on the subway and and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, it was a nice experience to live there. Um, yeah, everything works. <laughs> yeah, it's very well organized city. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and, and then you yeah, and then you went back and and continued with. Or how did you come back to Sweden, by the way? Yeah, it was. I, I guess it was a combination of uh, personal things, just wanting to get back to to family and friends. But also there was a new research center that was being set up, Science for Life Laboratory or SciLife Lab. Mm-hmm. And since I had been at the same kind of institute in Singapore, they thought I would be an interesting employee. Mm-hmm. So I started there like almost at the same time as it was opened in, in Solna. And what's the mission of SciLife Lab? I guess now it has a, a lot of missions, but it, it's both both research and providing infrastructure, like providing really heavy machinery for w- w- what they call high-throughput biology, so like mm-hmm. DNA sequencers and protein mass spectrometers where you can measure proteins and... Mm-hmm imaging and you know, measuring a lot of different things mm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and then speaking of trying <laughs> to push forward here in the the background so we can move into also interesting topics but uh, you moved into more data science topics right there right after or yeah um, yeah so it, it was a mixed bag I mean when I came back to Stockholm I started to attend all of this because I, I had kept this interest in data science and machine learning all the mm. time. I had started a blog right. that that, uh, that is called Follow the Data that right. <laughs> I, yeah. I haven't updated now in a while. But I started that in Singapore. And then when I came back, I started to go to all of these meetups and, and um, yeah, doing some hobby projects in ML. And I also did some ML-inspired things in my in my work mm-hmm. at SciLife Lab. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, eventually 2017 I decided to just go all, all out uh, ML mm-hmm. and and work with that in industry. Mm-hmm. And that was first in IBM or what do, what was the first Yeah. Right. That was at IBM. Mm-hmm. And you also continued uh, to work uh, or was it still focused on bioinformatics or was it more general ML at that time? At IBM? No, it was... Um, I mean, I, I think there was some kind of idea that I would work in their health arm, but then as 
as it turned out, I, I was working with um, like industrial production, like uh, aluminium steel plants and uh, uh, pulp, paper pulp right. mill, <laughs> and uh, a little bit of SL, yeah, yeah, the subway here in <laughs> Stockholm. <laughs> But but it was um, it, it was only six months yeah. because I mean yeah go, going a bit ahead here I I started at Peltarion yeah. after that and I had already like applied to Peltarion before I started mm. at IBM but mm. then there was yeah because there was no opportunity there but then when they came back to me then I decided well I. Mm. I still want to work. What there. attracted you to Peltorium, <laughs> by the way? And yeah, I, I worked there as well, of course. But yeah. what attracted you to Peltorium? I think it was uh, the people uh, were one big thing. Like, I mean, you you were working there, and uh, Lars Sjösund, who I knew from Stockholm AI, I, I had I had become quite engaged in the Stockholm AI meetup right. group, yeah. and then I. Uh, then I also uh, had heard that the founders were very clever and mm. had done cool things. Yeah. So I guess that was the main reason. Mm. Yeah. Also, um, I think we hold off with Codon yeah. because we can take that together, both of you. But before we move there, <coughs> perhaps we could get the intro for Alex as well. Um, unless there is something else you would like to add before we move into Codon. No, I think we can. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> So Alex, yeah, how would you describe yourself? So <laughs> it Alex? all started in a, <laughs> in a once little upon a, once, once upon, upon a time, time in a little country <laughs> called Costa Rica. <laughs> okay, so you came from Costa Rica. Then. So I am from a shinier place. Yes. Um, <laughs> Where in Costa Rica? It's well, San Jose is pretty much San Jose, in, yeah. city capital. Yeah. The capital, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a very small country, but I've been yeah. there twice. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so you I, like it? I love it. Mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic, both from the surfing and the ecotourism. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. My favorites that stayed a little bit in Tamarindo and then down Santa Teresa. <laughs> of those places. I don't know. So maybe yeah. different to uh, San no, Jose was, a little bit. I was in a in a in a restaurant in Santa Teresa and. Yeah. Our table was the only non-Swedish table. <laughs> Swedes <laughs> love this place, including the owners. Isn't I that mean, funny? It's so like Santa Teresa has been sort of invaded by Swedes. It's invaded by Swedes. Well, you know. <laughs> I didn't know this. Yeah, I knew that. It's it's a, another like a little Stockholm. <laughs> uh, backpacking, maybe I don't know, surfing wannabes. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Anyway. But anyway, yeah. So basically, yeah, I yeah, I come from uh, originally from Costa Rica. I moved in here in two thousand eight. In in 2008, I um, I started uh, with a master's in in um, bioinformatics in KTH, okay. and then I started. Uh, I got like six months of that, and then my supervisor told me, "Oh, there's this PI in Karolinska that needs a bioinformatician. Mm -hmm. Do you want to you know like work half time there?" And then I'm, yeah, sure. So my two year short stay in Sweden turned into. What's 14 years now? 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> Unexpected. Yeah. So you were there more or less for the university uh, as, you know, maybe to come, go back after university? Uh, yeah, my, my plan was never to move to Sweden. I mean, that was such a weird, cold country. Yeah. It, yeah, <laughs> you know, no, it, it was just, it was just temporary. Just, I, I wanted to study bioinformatics because mm -hmm. my background is in computer science. I, I've been uh, programming since the age of 13. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh but uh, lately, I, before coming here, I, I switched to biology and I thought that uh, combining. Uh, by combining the two things was really, really interesting. And this um, uh, next generation sequencing was all the rage then. And the thing is that in Latin America, there's, there were no sequencers in Latin America. I don't think we even have them still. So uh, it was the only place that you could say. And, and Sweden, to, the, to, to their credit, was the only country that had like a bioinformatics uh, masters in every university. Mm. So it was, I mean, it was a very rare thing in, in 2008. Mm. So um, uh, that's how I ended up here. And uh, I, did, I, did, I did a, a short um, bioinformatics masters at, at KTH, 
which I mean that was that was awesome. I mean, the, it was we were five people in the masters, yeah. so I had the teachers. This Fressen, uh, 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 Eric, Eric Fressen, yeah. Eric yeah. Fressen, yeah. Fressen. You don't know. Uh, you had it, this beautiful. I had my own personal own tour, personal tour. <laughs> like you know, I would PT. sit with, with him and then just ask him questions, and he would be so excited to just tell me everything. But he would sit with me with four hours and just. Talk about the uh, and this science. is the beauty when you're only five or six yeah, in, in your masters, right? Yeah, that was amazing. It was the wow. best masters ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I moved to to Karolinska. That was also, I mean, <laughs> it was not a very successful PhD, but I did learn quite a lot. Um, I I started uh, chromating uh, 3D chromating architecture, which. Uh, I mean, you, you know uh, your chromosomes. If you, if you stretch your genome, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's actually three meters long. Mm. So you have a string that is three meters long, that fits into every cell in your in your body, and no, you cannot break it. You need to duplicate it, and uh, so take it apart, each chromosome one by one, throw it into a big ball of twine, and you cannot break it, right? Because then you get mutations and stuff Mutation. so it's it's a uh, the this uh, my phd was about figuring out how does this three meters ball of twine <laughs> gets to fold into this minuscule little space without tangling and uh, and uh, yeah. and you know depending on how you fold the genome you get either an eye or a or a foot right yeah. so the folding so. is where the the true information it's it's a, so it's it's an area called epigenetics yeah. so it's uh, it's the reason why you have the exact same genome in your eye and your foot but you don't see with your feet right no. <laughs> so it's it's the it's the other the, the software layer of the cell because the mm. the, the the genome is hardware i mean it, you can't change it mm. uh, so the the epigenome is more like the software is the things that you can modify to get different cell types out of the exact same genome so, so would you say like the, the pro processor in a computer is like a genome and the software that you run on the processor is the epigenetics? Or? Yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's hard because in biology, the, there's no difference between the, the processor and the program. It's all mixed together. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's the wrong analogy because okay. it, it, you don't have a processor. In the, 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 the code is the program. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, it's kind of... Yeah, it's complicated, but um, yeah. So that was that was pretty cool, and because none of the experiments worked, I had to try <laughs> everything and learn everything. And uh, because I was the only bioinformatician in the entire building, I I didn't have anybody to ask, so I had to learn ev everything by myself. So that I mean, yeah, not but not the most papers, but uh, it was. Did you try to simulate it, or how did you go about trying to understand, you know, how, how the tangling worked, if that's the, the purpose? No, what we were trying to do is figuring out the the, the architecture, like how was it folded? Oh, the 3D structure of the, the 3D tru structure of the oh. of the chromosome. So the, we developed a wet lab technique that you would make this treatment and then you would sequence the result, and mm -hmm. then from that you could uh, you wouldn't come up with the whole architecture, mm -hmm. but you can figure out if this gene is usually found in the vicinity of this other oh, gene, right? So there's a lot of things that in the in the genome that act by proximity. Mm -hmm. So there's there's things that are, it, it, the genome acts like a scaffold where you mm -hmm. put different switches. Mm -hmm. And if the switch is close to a, a gene, then it can turn it off and turn it back on. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, yeah, location, location, location. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, I mean, we should speak about alpha fold and whatnot um, sometime Ooh, soon here. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a big, I'm a huge fan. Yes. <laughs> this is what I was referring to, and I couldn't find the word, like mm -hmm. the big breakthroughs with alpha fold yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. compared to the big breakthroughs you had, which mm -hmm. was. So let's go to the sequencing. Yeah. But, but yeah, but I add it to the list. So we, mm -hmm. I think we should cover that properly For so sure. people understand mm -hmm. that. But still, uh, oof, I'm so tempted to go to like what are the basic you know components of, of uh, bioinformatics you know genes and acid sequences and the genome but, but, and, and chromo I think, but chromosomes let, let, let's and wrap, but let's do the introduction and, and I think this is a good yeah. segue into mm. talking about this because we're using the word bioinformatics now and, and for, for listeners who are not into this world I think there's maybe a starting point with some of those definitions. Let, so let me tell you why bioinformaticians make good AI scientists. 
a good mm. that's <laughs> oh that's what a, a what a cliffhanger yeah, kind of cliffhanger <laughs> so how come because i mean there's three of us so clearly there's something there and we we tend to hire bioinformaticians mm -hmm. because it's they're easier to train uh, it's easier to train a bioinformatician and the, the reason is biological data is huge I mean, uh, every patient that I look at is 300 gigabytes per patient that I, mm -hmm. per person that I get and that I need to analyze, right? That's not very common in any other industry. I mean, when I was a software developer, I never saw data sets that size, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, or, or if, if there are, you usually don't have access to them. So bio, bio from, uh, biology has huge publicly available data sets that nobody knows how to manage. Um, they, it's, they're, they're terrible quality data sets because it's, in biology, nothing happens exactly the same the two times in a row, right? <laughs> it's, it's the world of one plus one equals three, maybe four, sometimes <laughs> one. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and it's I mean, very noisy. It's super noisy. So we're used to dealing with these imperfect data sets, huge data so sets. And make it work anyway and you have to make it work right so now you really the, all the tips and tricks that becomes really yeah. for the dirty world useful yeah and uh, in in sweden at least we had i had the benefit of uh, my boss came the, the first project that he gave me was oh, you're a computer guy well uh, i need you to do this Oof, that's going to take six years to, to <laughs> process well uh, but how can we make it quicker well, I would need like a ton of computers. Well, we have like a thousand uh, computers in the in the cluster. Why don't you use those? I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, th that's the and, and it was impossible to solve that particular problem. And no matter how clever I write the, the software, is it's to this day you cannot solve that without uh, a massive amount of computers. And without uh, ensemble algorithms as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. awesome. Um, so how, I'm still trying to figure out, you know, what was the, the main, main contributions of, of the PhD work? Was it to try to understand how the actual structure was located for specific like genomes or was it how to, to do that? Or what was, how would you describe, you know, what the main, purpose was we were trying to figure out um so like i said there's there's regions of the genome where, where you have switches yeah. right and uh, normally those switches affect only the gene the, you think of the of the chromosomes as a linear plane right yeah. so you have in position five you have a switch and then you have a gene in position uh, 50 mm -hmm. right and then you say okay because it's very close then the, this this switch in position five is going to affect so that's true. When they're linearly close, mm. then it affects. Yeah. But what they found out is that, I mean, sometimes you can be five million bases away mm. and you still are regulated by the same switch. And that's because they are because close in 3D? In 3D, they're in the same place um, most of the time. Right, right, right. Uh, and also, I mean, there's different densities of uh, how deep into the wormhole do you, because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how deep you want to go yeah, into this. Please, but love it, it, love it. But I mean, there's there's different densities of of the folding. So there's 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 parts of the chromosome that are so tightly packed mm. that they cannot be opened to express the genes that they encode. And those yeah. those parts are the are the the genes that you're not supposed to express in that particular cell type. Okay. So the 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 compaction of the uh, of the of the chromosomes plays a plays a role, mm -hmm. and also the proximity of different elements or different genes to each other play I a role. See. So you need so, to find all these kind of features so, that impact. And know. this is beyond the resolution of, of even the highest microscopes, right? Yeah, right. So uh, so what you need to do is you need to use next generation sequencing to what, what essentially the, the protocol that we that we designed was you you take a, a the, this ball of twine and you throw a, you you submerge it in glue right mm -hmm. so now everything that is kind of in the same place it sticks together mm, yeah, okay yeah. now take that glue and grind it <laughs> okay and make little like chop it up into a million pieces yeah and uh, now you're going to have pieces of glue that have pieces of one chromosome and piece of another chromosome. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, 
uh, you have these strings uh, tie, uh, glued together. Now, now tie two of them, rejoin them, mm -hmm. and so that they're now one consecutive piece of DNA. Mm -hmm. And now sequence that. Yeah, right. So what it would get is, uh, let's say, uh, a billion little pieces of, right. of, of sequence that I have to uh, map to the genome. And, and the, uh, okay, and the, the tricky part is that every cell has a slightly different config, well, a very different configuration. Mm -hmm. So now you take, you take all that, you throw them into a blender, <laughs> you mix them up, so I get <laughs> one piece from one cell, another piece from another cell. So what we would get is like, okay, these two parts of the chromosome are usually together. So why is that, you know? And then that's what the, the whole, uh, well, the, the whole uh, PhD was trying to, to optimize the, the, uh, the uh, bioinformatic pipeline to analyze that type of data because nobody had done that, yeah. this type of, of uh, protocol before. There's because because really th this is so complicated. So you need to basically build the pipeline, you need to build the production line in order to even analyze this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's full of artifacts. So the, the first, my first job was, you know, getting super happy uh, a thousand times and then just to figure out that it was an artifact. Like, <laughs> okay, that, that'll happen regardless of, of <laughs> so. So yeah. given all these kind of small grinded pieces of sequences, then trying to see how that maps to the original genome sequence, and then you can figure out what the 3D position basically is. Mm -hmm. so. And it's not a, a fixed position. It's the probability of being yeah, in, that, in yeah. the vicinity. Because of right? all the artifacts and whatnot. No, no, because the, the, mm -hmm. uh, every cell, uh, it's a stochastic process. So it's not, not a way crystalline way. form that <laughs> always folds in exactly the same no, way. Like everybody uh, folds a slightly. So there's a, uh, there's a higher probability of, of being in the vicinity of a regulator, uh, regulatory element. Yeah. You know, so it's... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a it's very a interesting, problem. it's a yeah. very uh, interesting it's a, problem. It was a really, really cool problem. Uh, I, I had lots of fun uh, with the cluster and trying different things and uh, yeah. Awesome. Was after K, uh, KI, was that when you started uh, Codon or do you have no, anything? No, so after, that? after the postdoc, I spent uh, six months uh, while I was writing my, my thesis in AstraZeneca. Uh, also working in bioinformatics. Then I went to Scilab, and oh, I right. think that's when uh, when we met. Oh, okay. um, so you were there at the same time as Mikael? Yeah, right. Yeah. So for, for yeah. a while, we, we were there at the same time. I mean, we, we all knew Michael, of course. He was the the, uh, the guru of uh, <laughs> bioinformatics. Uh, so now, now he's known as the guru of, uh, of AI, but back then he was all about the next generation sequencing. So uh, the, the reference, the, the, the person you would call when you didn't know what to do. But is, when you wrote your, when you got published in Nature, is that part of uh, the Singapore life or here in Stockholm or both? Yeah, so Nature, like I, I've published one paper in the journal that is just called Nature, mm -hmm. but Nature also has some, some like other titles like Nature Genetics, Nature Biotechnology, Nature Methods, etc. So the one that was in the Nature Nature was uh, part of Singapore life. Yeah, yeah, and and, the, and 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 for no one who doesn't know, Nature is a big deal, you know, in academic. Circuits, I would say, yeah. it doesn't matter which discipline you're in. So it's a big deal, even if you're not, yeah, right? In my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a big deal. In um, biology, you talk about CNS, cell, nature, and science. Those, those are like the big ones. Um, but even for physics or anything else, yeah. nature and science are, are the big ones. What do you think about some people that say that deep mind, you know, that get published rather frequently in both science and nature have, um, what do you call it, a fast lane into that because of who they are and potentially the importance or the way they select articles these days has degraded in some way? Can you see what I mean? I, I'm not sure if it's true. Uh, because it's still, of course, super big in you know inventions and, and and knowledge that they have provided. But some people claim that you know they they just get published because who they are rather than what they did, and it's super hard for anyone else to get in there these days. 
Well, I think it's both. I, I think they do really good work from, yeah. from what I have seen. But, but it's also true that like these journals are referred to as like glam magazines <laughs> in the biology <laughs> community. It's like, you know, famous professors have an easier time yeah. getting in there. And you know the editors maybe and stuff like that. So it is true. But I also think DeepMind do really good work that probably deserves to be there. So I, 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 I love this <laughs> joke. The Vogue of Science. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, but, but I just wanted, uh, yeah. But when you were, uh, you were there together, mm -hmm. and then um, you used to wrap up that part of the story. Oh yeah. So as I am in in science in in sci life, and I'm, I'm a happy camper there. I'm, I I'm a um, I'm doing uh, bioinformatics and um, I'm having fun. And then the the. Um, uh, Eric, the 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 other uh, code room confounder, uh, turns around to me. Confounder, the, uh, confounder. <laughs> <laughs> the other confounder. Um, he tells me like, ah, let's start a company. I said, eh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that? Huh? What year was that? Yeah, I, I mean, this is not code on yet. No, no it's that's not double. Code that's double strand. We okay. started. We started a bioinformatics company. It, it was two years before Codon, and Codon is three years, so maybe five years ago. Yeah. So what's yeah, the name of that company? Double Strand Bioinformatics. Oh, Double Strand. See, so, yeah, and that's that's we started Double Strand Bioinformatics and doing again bioinformatics and a little bit of machine learning, and then all is good, and we survived, and it was it was go going well, and then we remembered this guy was, uh, and then we said like Michael, we should start a company together, and then we. Then we started uh, Codon, and then yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. the people from Double Strand also joined Codon, basically. It was only two. It was it was ah, Eric yeah, and me. Yeah. So okay. we were two. We were two guys, and uh, mm. yeah, we just uh, we saw that there was. Uh, I mean, there was uh, a lot of. of uh, we still do a lot of bioinformatics, and and we're trying to make a niche for ourselves in the in the biotech, like being the AI of biotech, yeah. uh, because we all come from the um, from the biological world, and um, but uh, there we also have like like completely AI and completely ML unrelated mm. uh, projects. Or pure AI. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 okay, but. What, what year was this? When did you get started with Codon? 2019. 2019. And the founders are you two and Eric and two or no? That's the three. Yeah. Ones. Well, yeah. Well, there was a fourth founder also, but he moved to Taiwan. Uh -huh. So yeah, uh, decided <coughs> to. And what was the thinking? What, what do you say the, the mission and the speciality of Codon is? I mean, it's kind of obvious, but but still. How would you phrase the speciality of Codon? And what does the name come from, by the way? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the genetic code. Yeah. The, the genetic code that, like, determines how uh, DNA is translated to amino acids. So Codon is a, is a triplet of nucleotides mm. that codes for an amino acid. But then we also thought, like, yeah, it has something to do with coding it's cool like a, it's mm. like a, a, a dual dual purpose word. Cool, but yeah, it's a triplet of nucleotides. <laughs> <laughs> and you were a triple as well. Yeah, that joined it, right? Oh, okay, oh, I see it. I think uh, uh, most other people that don't know bioinformatics just thinks you know, cool name, software coding, right? But yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, but we're a, a consultancy in machine learning and data science, and we you know, do all kinds of projects, like we can do them from from start to end or 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 some part of them. And as Alex said, we, we do all kinds of projects. Uh, due to our background, maybe we have an extra edge in life science. Mm. Uh, but yeah, we have all kinds of projects. Can you give some highlights perhaps? Some interesting projects you have worked with? Oh yeah, I, I, I no, don't look at me. I don't know. I have signed so many NDAs. I don't know what I can say. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, I'm always afraid of saying the wrong thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, one project that that I guess we can talk about is with uh, Svegro. So that's mm -hmm. an uh, ecological um, 
what's it called? Ecological Greenhouse mm. Company. That's on Färingsö next to Ekerö outside of Stockholm. And yeah, they they are quite big in the area. You know, when you go to you know, Willis or Coop or, or another shop and you buy like a you buy like a pot with basil or something like that. It's often from Svegro. And uh, we have we have uh, or we are still uh, building out a solution for them for forecasting their yields. Mm-hmm. And there we have worked on the on the whole chain. We we started by setting up cameras. I guess you were out there. No, Eric was the one. Uh, Eric was climbing <laughs> a ladder and nailing yeah. the cameras to the to the posts. Yeah, setting up the cameras. The, the, the entire process. End to end. End to end. Yeah, and then we have trained models to you know estimate how how tall they are, I mean, on average, of course, they so are huge. He, I mean, I think you would need to, to just elaborate a bit more. Yields, meaning like some kind of plants growing somewhere in some... Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we're, uh, actually I, w- I was a bit imprecise. It's actually the height that we are looking at in most of the cases mm-hmm. because, you know, they need to grow them to a certain height because they have to fit in these bags with mm-hmm. the pots. They have different different sizes and they need to plan. And it's a huge... Operation. I think they said they can, they can produce like 30 million of, of this mm-hmm. a year or something like that. So it's some kind of what kind of plant or is it? Is it? Uh, uh, so the first one we did in the in the like proof of concept was basil basilica, mm. and now we're also doing uh, dill, cilantro, thyme, timian. So this is when you go to Ikea and you buy your pot of basil. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. then, and basically, this y- they are picked at a certain time when they have a certain height, so they fit perfectly in the bag, the yeah. way to yeah. present it. Yeah, but the problem yeah. is, even, is, is, is tough because uh, on a Monday, you need this many. Ah. But on a Thursday, you need this many. So it's not just like, let's grow as many as we can. Because if you grow them and you don't sell them, you have to throw them away. Oh. So they have to Optimization optimize problem. so yeah, that they, they, have they, plan. they have the yield that they will need on the day of the delivery so that it, it so that they don't have to throw so away on plants. On the day of the delivery, I need 50,000 plants at this height. Exactly. Not more, not less. Not less, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, there is a, there is a margin. Mm. But <laughs> so how can you control that? Is just how much you know, water them or what? Or how, how do you control the yield? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, temperature is is the main oh, is the okay. main thing that you can uh, control because they have a weather control system inside the greenhouse, mm-hmm. so we can get data from that and and analyze it and yeah, mainly temperature, but also uh, irrigation and yeah, maybe like changing the composition of the soil sometimes. So then you set up a number of cameras or yeah. Yeah, sensors that you can uh, measure. Yeah, they already had the sensors, the cameras we we set up, okay. and then we started to collect images and annotate. So they they set up little like rulers mm-hmm. uh, in in, in ah, these pots. In each pot, <laughs> you can yeah. do like number of centimeters high yeah. or something. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. And. Um, and then they have a QR code, and we we also did the like thing that prints out the QR codes, <laughs> <laughs> and then it recognizes a QR code because it's important to know when this crop was planted, uh, because they they have this you know schedule, and then um, and then we started to collect a lot of images, and we sat in the summer of 2020 looking at a lot of these images and <laughs> counting the lines on this ruler like, oh, eight, annotating 12 yeah just annotating thousands of images everything looked like basil to get the training to that. get you a dream training training data set. you were dreaming about basil yeah. yeah yeah to get a good training data set yeah and what type of model were you using if you can share um yeah so in in the end it turned out to be a efficient net mm. Uh, I yeah I forgot B4 or something or B1 I, or I think it was B4 but not hundred percent sure anymore but I think it was B4 and and for people that's interested efficient net is like an, um, a neural architectural search optimized version of like REST net or something right 
Yeah, uh, I yeah I, I know it's a neural architecture search based, but yeah, that that's about what I know. We tried a lot of different ones. Mm. And, and but but let me let me ask this from another angle. Uh, what was your process to find the the different? You know, in, very practically, how did we go about to try to find the right algorithm to fit the problem, and how much did you have to code, and how how much could you find it in a, you know, in a, in a TensorFlow library or something like this. So, on a very practical term, how, how yeah. did we go about it? Yeah. So, um, in in the first iteration, so th this project has had two parts, like one part in 2020 and another part now where we do all of, all of the other crops. In the first one, we actually used the Beltarium platform <laughs> ah, <laughs> to cool. to find the yeah find the best model. Cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's our our modus operandi. We first do a proof of concept mm -hmm. with yeah. uh, with a new customer. We always recommend let's do a proof of concept. Make sure mm -hmm. that you have the data in place. That you have that you interested in the right questions. I mean, I mean that are answerable questions mm -hmm. because yeah. uh, I mean we get people that want like a general AI. Uh, solution and and, uh, and and then the other you side. You don't have a solution for that. Again? <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, so first we do a, a POC to make sure that there's, you know, it's it it can be made into a in, into a product, and then we go into an MVP. And then we go into production, right? I, I'm missing a step there. Very similar to the steps you prop uh, propagate for, I think. Yeah, the, the uh, Peltorian thing about you know the prototype, pilots, and production mm -hmm. steps. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah. So in, so in this case now, uh, used to be r really, really down to earth. So you used uh, the Peltorian platform as mm -hmm. a way to basically be able to you know, use the platform to very easily try the different, the libraries or whatever it was available in there. Is that how it worked or? Yeah, because I, I was familiar with the platform and I thought, yeah. okay, it will be really fast to, to uh, go through some different models and, and see how they work. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, was, it was a nice solution. We also had an, uh, intern who was working with us then and he tried some uh, some other variations in keras but yeah in in the end the, the efficient net was more successful mm -hmm. and then and then when you find that uh, you know could you use the peltron platform or do, or do you download that as an open library or how does it work now is this a tensorflow so, uh, you know i'm, I'm asking as, as an as a layman who doesn't know how, how it sort of how you go about it how much you need to think about getting your algorithm working and how much is basically open source in some ways library you can use i mean we could have used an open source library as well and i mean now now we are doing everything in in pytorch mm. also um but yeah, it w it was it was mostly convenience because I knew it would be quick because in you you have all of these uh, visualizations of how the training goes. You can look at like so now you could have the whole operation stack in Peltorian instead a little bit. Yeah, and it, it also had this thing where you can see the predictions like oh it got this one wrong, it got this one right. Okay, that's. Like that's interesting to know. And one one funny thing, by the way, is that uh, you know in the beginning we were just looking at the the images as, as they were. So first we had to use another model, an object detection model, to find these sticks. Mm -hmm. And for that I used um, some model from the Detectron two. It's from Facebook mm -hmm. AI research, mm -hmm. and and that worked really well. Like that was know 100 examples and it, it learned to find those sticks and then you have these basil plants and then you have the stick and you have the QR code uh, but then when we were looking at like this was actually something we did sort of outside of the platform but we tried to look at okay what is the model looking at in the image yeah, exactly with the, with the, the wolf uh, problem yeah can, can i can i can i take responsibility for that 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I think I, I think I was the one that asked you like, are you sure it's it's uh, looking at that and not doing something crazy? And that's that, I think yeah. that's when. Yes, I think this is a serious topic, and, and we should actually, I think, speak a bit about this as well. Mm -hmm. If you take explainable predictions or explainable AI, mm -hmm. um, I know you have a big interest and knowledge in, in this, Mikael, as well. Um, and I guess if we start with that, you know, let's start it in this way. So I think there is a big like discussion about the need and the use for explainable AI. And... Um, if I take a person that I do respect but still disagree on this point, uh, Jan LeCun, mm. he has famously said, you know, at some panel debate, you know, do you need to have explainable predictions or not? And he said, explainability, schmittability or something. <laughs> and <laughs> says, you know, it's no need to have explainability. It's completely over mm, estimated or the value of it is, is, is hyped. I, I can't say I, uh, I agree with that, but what's your thinking? You know, do you think there is a need to have, you know, well-working, explainable predictions. Uh, yes, <laughs> now I can. <laughs> How could I? Guess that? <laughs> <laughs> Leading question on this. <laughs> no, I, I can um, uh, continue on on this thing that I was just saying uh, as an example. Yes. Because um, so you have this image, right? <laughs> where you have the basil plants, you have the ruler, you have the QR code. And we had a model that yeah. was working really well. This is funny. <laughs> and then <laughs> when we looked with uh, the GradCam algorithm on what it was looking at, we saw that it was only analyzing the QR code. <laughs> <laughs> so he was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was like... Too smart for school, <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then it could figure out like, okay, so this is uh, planted, you know, 25 days ago and then it's probably about this tall and so like it, he, may, he, he went yeah. reverse engineering on the problem yeah <laughs> but you mean it actually understood the QR code and could from that figure out when it was planted I mean I, I don't exactly know but uh, yeah the fact is that it, it was only focusing on on this QR code and huh. somehow that information was enough for it it's, to a, it's a big stick with yeah. a with a QR code that encodes the date right yeah. and the stick has the little lines yeah. And then they were like, whoa, it's, it's recognizing the, the heights and everything. And I was like, are you sure? Can, what happens if you blur the, the QR code and then, the, you know, it didn't work? Uh, so it was the relationship between the QR code and the height of the plant. Is yes. that what you're saying? No, they was looking at the, it was looking at the QR code, right? In, 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 in somehow it was making the prediction. It was focusing all its attention on the QR code. So we don't know what it was doing. But it was not looking at the at the ticks on the on the. So he was stick. so basically, uh, from the training data set, it, it you could the QR code related to when this was planted. Yeah. yeah. Was typically uh, the right outcome, uh, the the right correct answer. Mm. So then he basically focused only on the QR code and you know so predicted that well, this last QR code had so many days behind, so that's why it worked. Instead of really looking at the the real true height, but still, how could it figure out from the QR code yeah. when it was planted? You know, that, that's right? yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you see my frustration here. <laughs> we don't know. Can it really do that, or can you reason about you know why you thought the attention was so much on the QR code? But the QR code is is generated from a string that contains the date. The date. And, so you, and, you actually and think it learned how the QR code was generated? You mean is do you think the network was that smart? I mean, I, I guess it has figured out some some pattern. The topology pattern of the QR code? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it sounds uh, long, far fetched. Uh, uh, say. Maybe smarter than you think. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's, uh, we, I don't know exactly how QR codes work, but it, it, mm. it could be something that it's, you know, this particular region of the QR code. Uh, but empirical when evidence, when you blur the QR code. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is that it was. Why would the QR code matter when you're trying to figure out, you know, the, the height of Could the plant? Could it be that it tries to see the relationship in terms of height compared to the QR code? It could be that the QR code changes color and we don't, don't notice it. For example, mm -hmm. uh, that the paper is darker at the end of the cycle than mm -hmm. at the beginning. Okay. Something as, or, or maybe with the, with the water it becomes blurry, something like that. I mean, well, we, we... What is the height of the, the QR code? Is it staying constant or is it going blurry? 
No, the QR code, they put it when they plant the... the, the, it's, in the, the, the it's in the pot. It's in the pot. And it just says the date, and then it follows the plant, so that we know, mm-hmm. you know, these, these are like uh, 200 meters of plants, so you don't know like what, at what time each section was planted, mm-hmm. unless you, you mark them somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we, we... I mean, we were hoping that it would focus on, on the lines on the ruler or the, uh, yeah, the, the leaves... But it was <laughs> it was not caring about that at all. I, I agree. I don't think it was the code in the QR code, but no. something in there was was uh, um, yeah. was tripping it. Was, but, was but it's an interesting it. case now because it sort of highlights that you need to kind of know what what it's focusing on. Yeah. Mm. And the, there is another example from medical uh, yeah, medical image processing. I may have written about this in a in a blog post before, but. Uh, so they trained this X-ray analyzer uh, that was uh, trying to determine if, um, yeah, if, if something had been broken or if if the rupture was severe enough to need medical attention or something like that. And they had trained a really good model. Like, yeah, this is working, cool. But then when they applied this type of uh, method where you look at what it's focusing on, then it turned out it was only focusing <laughs> on a, a watermark that is found on certain scanners, x-ray scanners. <laughs> and those are portable scanners that you bring on an ambulance. Mm. So when you bring something on an ambulance, then it's probably like worse. It's probably someone who, who, who has a, a worse case of this. And so it was just using that information and not looking at the bones at all. Crazy. I mean, it's funny, similar to another Peltorium project that we had that looked at um, uh, patient journal texts, if you remember. And, and uh, at that time, we wanted to know if they were to, subscri- um, to prescribe antibiotics or not, given um, like journal text for, for dentists. And then you had the journal text, and, and then we use explainable AI. And what it actually turned out to be looking at was the name of the doctor <laughs> and not the text in the journal at all. <laughs> <laughs> and some doctors were apparently prescribing antibiotics much more than others. Yeah. <laughs> that was more important than the actual content of the, of the journal. But, but circling back to the core topic of explainable AI here. So, um, I mean, like the argument we've had here is that, you know, uh, how to do explainable doesn't mean like you, 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 you need to follow exactly the neurons, but you can even ask uh, the neural network to explain what is your key markers. I guess that, like that's that. a question to, to both of you. you, know, do you what do you think the right way to do explainable, explainable predictions is? Is it more introspective or is it more this kind of attribution based or it could be also more generative like WT5 stuff? What's your thinking there? Do you think there is any value in doing introspection-based kind of explainable predictions? Mm, yeah, well, I, I think I'm, I, I'm not sure if there is like a general recipe. You, you should um, make it. You're <laughs> so humble all the time. And I think sometimes you have to take a stand. You know, this is worthless. This is useful. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've mostly worked with explainability in in like images and then in tabular data. So mm. in, in tabular data, I usually I usually use SHAP, mm. the Shapley value-based explainability yes. framework, which which I think is is good. Uh, haven't had the chance to do that much in NLP. Just read some papers about it. So um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if you have any tips. Is it good to look at the attention weights? Um, I, know, I know there I, are many. I was thinking more like attribution based, ba- meaning that you don't look at the model internally at all. You instead mm. use some kind of attribution to the input, like integrated yeah. gradients or even sharp values. Or, yeah. you know, grad cam could be one at least for images, but not so yeah. much for, for text, uh, at least not for BERT models. And then, you know, the question is should you attribute you know, the explanation mm. back to the input that you have for the network, and that's yeah. one way to do it, like attribution-based in that way. The introspection is more trying to figure out, you know, what neuron or what which, which layer in some way that is, yeah. you know, causing this type of prediction. Or even saying that, you know, looking at, at uh, simplistic like linear regression or something, you can find the coefficients and say, here are the coefficients that is, you know, the main... Um, 
cause for, for this prediction, and that would be more of an introspection type of explanation. And if you have any thoughts, you know, what the pros and cons of that type of explanation would be. Yeah, I, th I think attribution-based methods are, uh, are good if you want to base some kind of decision on it if you want to if you want to know like what what was it that that was responsible for this there's also another kind of explainability that I, I I don't know what the like general name for it is but like when you when you try to figure out sort of the the smallest change that would change the class right. of, yeah, of an example right, right. Or, or something like that yeah, that's the name of that I mean it's not conf uh, counterfactual yeah it is counter counter yeah factual, yeah right? exactly counterfactual I think that is yeah. quite interesting as well the right. introspection is is maybe more of sort of theoretical interest although I think it's very interesting like there was this uh, what was it, this open AI blog post where they found that like one neuron was responsible for <laughs> some very like it's interesting, <laughs> but not very useful, I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's but also, I would argue, and, and please, I'm going to be a bit more provocative here now, but, but this is, uh, I think, a very common opinion that, you know, the, the shallow models is, is very useful because you can understand them. Mm. And, and that's why you should resort to using them instead of using neural networks. And then you can simply look at, you know, decision trees or, you know, um, or at coefficients, or potentially, you know, even random forests, you know, have really way nice ways to, to find like the, the most you know important features that you can have, you know, like feature important importance metrics. Yeah. But I would argue at least that if you look at the simple like coefficient based, super simple kind of introspection or yeah, explainable uh, method, it's so easy to get fooled by that mm. because you could have this kind of it's, it has this nice name that I forgot right now, but. Uh, um, you can have dependencies between the features you have um, that is causing, you know, a single feature to have high importance. But in reality, there are other features just imp as important that the model has mm -hmm. learned that because they have so strong collinearity, you know, correlations, they just focus on one because they don't need to focus on the other. It's sufficient with one, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. you get fooled by this kind of, Im you know, feature importance metrics that you can see. Yeah, that's true. I, I think like in, in in an ideal case, if you have sort of a good idea of how the different features are related, uh, you could try to use causal inference mm. to try to figure out like what is really driving this, because then you have some model of which features are... Or at least use SHAP values, because of that, I think that's at least some kind of theoretical proof that it actually will find a better way to, to find feature importance, right? Yeah, I guess it should work a bit a bit better because it's like these coalitions of features and yeah, we don't need to go, go into that, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's not maybe I suffering in the same way. Yeah. yeah, perhaps you shouldn't go that deep, but uh, yeah. Sometimes it's nice to just go deep in some <laughs> tech as well. You know, and, and actually, you need to humor Anders here because it's it's up and down in terms of uh, uh, <laughs> how technical we are going with guests. Depending on if you know, sometimes we have a CIO on, on here and and like this, and I'm more of a business guy, and and I can see Anders letting me you know talk more, and then like mm. <laughs> in the after after work, yeah, that was a really good presentation, but I. I, I I kind of want to talk tech now. I want to go nerdy. <laughs> so, so guys, come on. Come on. <laughs> no, Humor Anders. Humor Anders. No, but let's us try to close the topic of explainable AI. And I, I think we, and please disagree if you don't agree, but I think we can agree that explainable AI is very important. Mm. And there are, I would argue, good techniques, even for deep learning based methods to find good explanations that are useful. And you have, you know, direct experience of this from the yeah. like water plant uh, or the, the plant experience, right? So, yeah, definitely. And, and not to overstate, well, okay, I'm biased because I'm, I'm, I'm the, 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 I'm a little bit downstream, right? So mm. I'm, I'm the, the, the one looking at data sets all day. Mm. And I think, I, I think that, I mean, if you don't spend enough time trying to figure out 
what's wrong with your data set. Yeah. Then you end up with these problems in the in right. upstream, right? Yeah. So I think that, I mean, people go straight into try to fine tune and get the best value of yeah. the, you know, make all these crazy models and they don't have S any ensemble clue. models. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then they throw the ensemble models at it. And, and then they don't have any idea of, of what the data is is yeah. is really is yeah. really uh, saying, right? Yeah. So I think that m uh, most of these uh, of these problems that you get upstream is because you didn't spend enough quality time with your data downstream. I mean, we, we should resort, I think, to, to one of the Andrew Ng kind of yeah. And, uh, well, let's comments, go. Right? Let's let's I mean, move now from explainable AI and understand now that Alex made a link from a explainable AI to data data centric AI and how important it is to start thinking data centric and then. The segues, Andrew Ng, maybe. So, yeah. Do, do you know his, uh, I guess you read the batch and all the, the newsletters that he have and what yeah. Andrew Ng is saying. Yeah. So in short, you know, he's speaking about the model-centric versus data-centric ways of working, I guess. And, and then you can do what, what you mentioned, Alex, that you know, trying to find in whatever kind of improvement in accuracy by tweaking the model and, and God forbid, for, for, forgive, <laughs> use ensemble models. But in reality, if you don't understand the data properly, you can get fooled by the accuracy you receive if you just tweak the, the model. Mm -hmm. that yeah. mm. So in, in well, with all this explainable part, uh, so I, I work more at the data level. So what I, what I try to do is torture my data set. Yeah. I mean, uh, I torture my data set. I love it. Until it confesses. <laughs> okay. That's called ethical yeah. data science. So you uh, torture your data set. I torture my data set. I, I want to learn I, these I, methods of torture. I <laughs> twist it. I rotate it. I, 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 I add noise, you know, like really, really <laughs> screw it up. So And this so is what you learn if you're in bioinformatics. And this is what you learn if you if you ever look at that biological uh, data sets that yeah. you need you, you need to love really it. have a love lot of variation so that you 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 keep the the, the model on their toes because uh, my view is that uh, ai is lazy they'll always find the the most shortcuts. obvious thing shortcuts, right yeah. the shortcuts and then those are not what uh, that's not what i want you to look at i want you to look at that other <laughs> thing so i i try to like mix mix up the uh, the, the data as much as possible so that any, uh, in a way that artifacts should be eliminated, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and, and then not having to have the problem. And, that, and, and also do proper analysis and make sure that it, you have a good experimental design. But could, we, could we really unpack this and go a bit nerdy for how you taught your data, mm -hmm. <laughs> concretely? I mean, uh, so you have a set of, of, uh, uh, you have a set of, of, uh, of plants, right? Of yeah. pictures of plants. Well, you can zoom in and out of, of plants, uh, zoom in and out of, and subsample the, the the picture in a million different ways. Uh, you can blur the image. You can you can change the colors. I mean, because in in doing all those things, you know that the the big patterns are going to stay, but the 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 noise, the noise is is going to be blurred away, right? So um, that's like a, a simple example, but also. Just the the I've I've had uh, success just adding like Gaussian noise to a to a tabular data set. Because so what you're saying you're adding noise to data sets in order to how, how can that help? Because if you if you add noise, then uh, it it can't get fixated on the fact that you have like the same value always, like the same set of values. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's it's similar to just uh, um, the, what is, what is this? The data augmentation or? No, the data, when you block the layers that you filter the. God. Do you mean dropout? Dropout, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, like dropout, but at the data, at the data, uh, at the uh, data, the data uh, level. At instead. the data level. So you, you can torture it that way. So so it, you're doing a lot of different things and you so basically it, it allows you to, well, you give more noise so, so so in the end, since the real features and artifacts, the, the, the hypothesis is that they, they, are, they will be they will come out. They will come out yeah. anyway. Yeah, because that will be the only thing that is constant. I think you know, time is flying away here, and I want to really extract you know, some knowledge from you guys that are experts in also bioinformatics here in some way. Let's go. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps we can just uh, speak a bit about you know, some of the core components of bioinformatics and, and we you have mentioned a number of terms here amino acids genomes genes chromosomes and whatnot C can we can you just try to explain a bit you know how do they relate to each other just give us like one on one on you know what 
how are the genome built up in some way? Is that a f do you see what how is mean? the genome built up? Um, well, I mean, you have to ask n not how the, the genome is built up, but maybe how how do you be how do you go from a set of instructions to a human being? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. let's go there because the the genome is just a sequence, a very long sequence of, of four letters. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the interesting part that comes in, in how do you interpret that to create this huge diversity, right? From the, if you have a, the same software program, you run it 500 times, it's always going to get the same result. But here but you get the foot and an eye. The, here you get a foot and an eye out of the exactly, I mean, you have exactly the same genome in your eye and your foot. I mean, yeah. there's, there's mm. very, very, very loss, uh, very, very little loss there. Okay, so, so that's another like area on top of the genome. But still, you know, the genome itself contains a number of things. And, and, and you have proteins yeah. there as well. And, and, you know, yeah, well, maybe we can uh, zoom out a bit. Like, uh, so bioinformatics is the you know, science or, or technique to use statistics, data analysis and programming on biology, usually molecular biology. So all of these things that you mentioned are molecular biology and uh, there is the central dogma mm. that states that you have DNA which is like the fixed template and then that gets transcribed to a like transient message that is called RNA, RNA. and then that gets uh, translated into the protein which is yeah, like the building blocks you have it in in your your hair have it, in, yeah, your skin, yeah. everything, but also like hor yeah, hormones and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, everything, <laughs> not everything, but a lot of things that are happening in the body. So there are different levels and uh, proteins are made of amino acids. Mm -hmm. There are sequences of amino acids, so that's the amino acid. And both DNA and RNA are made of uh, nucleotides, these four, four letters, A, C, G, T. In RNA, it's ACGU, but okay, it's a no. detail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's that's great. I mean, you try to provide some kind of hierarchy or uh, yeah. some kind of uh, terminology. Of, and and we, know, we, 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 we've been trying to learn and get educated on this topic before. The Viranova guys. Oh, Do yeah. you know CEO Viranova, Mahama? Uh, Do you know? Uh, I know of them, but... But I don't... Because I it's don't interesting, know. like, they, they go down from this level, like, like, because this is the same story, right, around the genome, the RNA and all that. And then, you know, going into the microscopy, uh, you know, how to make these images smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and now we can go in another, from the same topic, we can go into bio... Yeah. Informatics. Okay, but then sequencing is another term that we used a lot. What is the problem of sequencing that you're mentioning? The problem of sequencing. What what is the like the like the industry of sequencing? Maybe? Yeah, sure. So uh, sequencing basically you have a you have a human genome. That's yeah. uh, what is it? Three three gigabases, right? Yeah. Uh, three gigabases or so three uh, three thousand million bases. Yeah. And you have one of those in every single cell in your body, yeah. and uh, you want to see. Okay, that's a sequence of letters. But yeah. how do I go from a physical molecule? to knowing what that sequence is. Right. And that's the process of sequencing. So you have a single molecule and now you want to sequence that, what and that is. And exactly. now you want to know what is the sequence of, of A, T, G, C, 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 T, D, yeah. like this. Three uh, billion. Three billion of those. And, and, uh, so, and that's the thing that took uh, 10, 10 years, years and three billion dollars. And now you can do it for a hundred dollars in 24 hours in a USB stick. So, um, yeah. And how does it really work? Because you can't like, look in a microscope, you know, what the sequence is. You have small samples of the sequence or how? So, what, so there's uh, different technologies. Uh, let's like the most, um, the most uh, common, like, the one that has like a monopoly over the, the market mm -hmm. right now is a company called Illumina. And uh, yeah. what they do is you, uh, you, you take the, the, the genome, mm -hmm. you chop it up in little pieces, yeah. and then you throw that into a, a flow cell. A what? A, a flow cell. So a it's a, cell? like a microchip okay. that has a, a, a pattern. It's, it's, if you look at, at that uh, chip 
on their microscope. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a microchip that is attached to a microfluidics device. Okay. So uh, if you look at that under the microscope, under the microscope it's, it's like, uh, like a honeycomb of, like a bee honeycomb, right? Mm -hmm. And then in each one of those wells, they have uh, a, a, like, let's call it sticky ends, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So in those sticky ends, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm, I'm yeah, really simplifying simplify this it. part. Because yeah, yeah, please simplify. Okay, so, <laughs> so in, in you have like these sticky ends and then these little fragments that you just put in the blender, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, you take those, you stick it to one of these wells. Mm -hmm. And then by a very complex chemistry, you basically make copies. Uh, they, okay. they stole all the stuff that your cells mm -hmm. use to create exact copies of the DNA and they put it on the chip. Yeah. So in each well, you're going to make many, 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 many copies of exactly the same uh, sequence, right. right? And then what they do is, they uh, remember this is plugged into a microfluidics device, right? Mm. And what is micro? So it's, it, they, can, they can flow with extreme precision different uh, chemicals. Mm. So they can flow a green chemical, and then red chemical, and then blue chemical, right? The trick here is that the blue chemical is attached to a base. Mm. An A. So if you if you throw in a blue, only the the A's will be attached to the DNA. Mm. So then you take a picture with a microscope, and then you throw in you wash and you throw in green, and then you take another picture with a microscope. So now all the wells that had a, a blue, and maybe some of them will have green, some of them will not have uh, green. So then you start to build the sequence. So you, 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 each one of those wells will give you, because they all have exactly the same sequence, they will all glow either green or blue or red and each one of those bases. And, and if anybody that knows an NGS, don't kill me, I'm trying to, <laughs> I, I, I know that it's, that it's way more complicated than that, but I mean, that, that's the essence. You, take a, a, you, you, you fill in with one color, you take a picture, you, you, you identify each one of the wells that incorporated that color, so you know that the next a base in that well was uh, one of these a specific letter, the blue letter, and uh, then you wash, and then you put the next one, and you do this 300 times, and then you get th a piece that is 300. The bioinformatics part is that, imagine now you have 1.5 billion little strings that are 300 base pairs mm -hmm. long, and now you have to figure out uh, where in a 3 billion uh, base pair uh, search space they came from mm. Mm. and that's where the fun starts mm. <laughs> the real data. that's where the data science starts yeah. yeah so taking a huge number of small samples of 300 base pairs i guess in this case yeah. Mm. yeah and then trying to fit them together so i guess they're overlapping as well so you need to find where the they start and the end of each of them are in some way or uh, it, it it can be like that, but, mm -hmm. but for the human genome, we have like a reference that you can compare wow, each. Yeah, yeah, of course, each you compare to, to the reference genome. Yeah. Uh, so you, you so take these 300 base pairs and you search over these 3 billion base uh, pairs, and then you see. take the next one, and then you search over those 3 billion base pairs. Ah, uh, of course, that one at makes a time. perfect sense. Now I get so much smarter, <laughs> or not, not smarter, but knowledgeable. Yeah, <laughs> but, but like for, for new things like SARS-CoV-2 virus, you, where you don't have a reference, you know, th then, then you do what yeah. you said, you yeah, okay. piece them together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool, and that's a very interesting... Um, but but uh, then the fun starts, yeah. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what, you know, if, if you try to dumb it down for me, like n now we are out of the wet lab, so to speak, and mm -hmm. now we're getting into the data. The part. data part, yeah. yeah. So then, for example, I mean, um, so what I, what I work with, uh, like my main customer is, uh, they make cancer vaccines. So I, I figure out, uh, uh, I sequence your, well, okay, let's, that other, uh, this uh, person uh, uh, genome, yeah. and then I, I, I sequence their tumor. Mm. because they have cancer, right? So when you line up all these reads against the human genome, then in, in, uh, in, um, in cancer, sometimes you will have differences. So you'll see uh, sequences in the tumor that you don't have in the normal, uh, in the normal sample. And this right? is mutations. These are mutations. 
And uh, like Michael was saying, these mutations get translated into tRNA and then uh, they get translated into, um, in, into protein. And these, these proteins, they look weird to the immune system. The immune system has never seen one of these. So they will attack it. In, in some tumors, they, they, they can't really recognize it. They have troubles finding these differences. Mm. So what this company does is that they, uh, um, uh, they, they amplify these differences. So they, they sequence the normal, they sequence the tumor, they find out all the differences. And then what we do is we use AI to help them identify what, what are the best candidates to teach the immune system how to fight off that, that cancer. And then they build a, a, a personalized vaccine for that, uh, so that it's um, so basically you're, you're you're vaccinating yourself against your own tumor, mm. so that if the tumor ever comes up again, your immune system will just pick up and kill it, just like you do with the normal flu. So uh, that's that's the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 used to be trying to be a little bit concrete data wise because I think let's go nerdy here. What, what is the fundamental data manipulation problems we are working on here, like from a from a data pipeline point of view to you know. So first, you 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 have to go from uh, three hundred gigabases, three hundred uh, gigabytes of data, to maybe six values, six mm -hmm. positions in your, so it's a data reduction. You have this huge search space and you have to find the six places in the genome that you can design your vaccine for, Oof. right? So that's, it's just a reduction, 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 and trying to figure out what is going to actually cure the patient. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that, that's the data. But I mean, it's, it's a lot of uh, the mapping, which is the first stage, then you have to do like a comparison. And this is, this is like I said, this very uh, noisy data set. So you have a lot of artifacts that you have to weed away because that's not going to help anybody. And so it's the, the um, distillation process of going from this huge amount of data to the, the one that is going to make a difference. Yeah. The data from the sequencer also has errors, mm -hmm. like uh, can be a couple of percent that are wrong. So you have to kind of try to wash that out somehow, mm -hmm. stuff like that. I mean, awesome. <coughs> and, and unfortunately, the time is flying away here a bit, but I'd like to cover at least um, one more uh, bioinformatics topic, which, which is um, AlphaFold mm -hmm. and what DeepMind oh, did, yes. right? Yeah. And we also have Alpha AlphaFold 2, I guess, that also mm -hmm. you know, broke the record in, in, in various ways. But... Perhaps we can start just, you know, what is AlphaFold? And we've spoken a bit about the 3D structure already, but mm -hmm. um, how can we concisely and, and, and in a simple way describe what AlphaFold does? Mm. Yeah, and, uh, I'll, I, I can start, you can continue. So this is about protein folding, like proteins are, are these you know, things that make up a lot of things in the body, but they are also very important for creating drugs, for instance, or create more efficient enzymes that can do something. So it's, it's very, they are very important. And proteins have this property that they fold into a certain structure. They have maybe, let's say, 400 amino acids, um, but you have to figure out how they fo will fold into 3D because the 3D structure will determine how they interact with other molecules. And I mean, it's it's key to know exactly what they look like. So the structure 3D. itself it contains like information that is key to how they function in some ways. Yeah. So you don't know yeah. the function until you know the 3D structure. Yeah. The, the structure is the function. Yeah. Okay. The structure is the function. I mean, I mean, uh, what we have with uh, with the proteins is. Uh, the sequence of the proteins. We know the sequence of all the proteins. Mm. Uh, we just don't know how they are going to look like when they're when they're folded, right. and yeah. therefore we don't know the function of those proteins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like yeah. since the 1960s, it has been understood that okay, they they will fold in a certain way. I mean, there are some exceptions, but usually they have like a state that they fold to. Mm. But someone calculated that if you had a protein with 100 amino acids and it just randomly explored the space, just changing the different amino acids, it would take 10 to the power of 52 years <laughs> to explore all of the conformations. So it can't be just a random thing. It, it, 
yeah, it, it happens in a structured way. And then, yeah, to make a long story short, it, there have been, people have been trying to solve this problem since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do they fold? And they used molecular dynamics, like trying to use physics to figure out, but it doesn't really work for more than 50, 70, 80 uh, amino acids. Um, but then alpha fold has been like a huge quantum leap in, yeah. um, and quantum not in a small sense but <laughs> a big quantum leap yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's it's much better than the ones and there is some kind of challenge fold. right that alpha fold competed in uh, yeah the casp yeah the casp, the casp challenge the critical assessment of protein structure prediction or something yeah it yeah. has been around since the 90s so you can tell that it's a very well-known problem mm -hmm. <laughs> that people have been trying to solve. Yeah, And they had previous results. I don't remember the name of the metric there that they had, but, but they, it was something around 30 or 40 or a scale up to 100 or something, right? That they, the previous approaches, non-deep learning based approaches were able to reach. I yeah, think, uh, yeah. yeah I, I, don't, I don't remember. And the I think the, the, the alpha fold one got up to fifty plus or something, and then the alpha fold two got up to eighty five or something. Like absurdly. It got, to, it got to a level where I mean, again, biology. Yeah. One plus one equals two. Yeah. Sometimes four. You know, so it's we got to the level where we really don't know if if they can go any higher because yeah. the things that we're measuring against is also not perfect. I mean, right. It has uh, randomized or a lot I mean of noise in it. You're, you're, there's some noise that you're going to expect. So we, we don't mm. know if we can get any higher. So Didn't they say basically that, you know, given our fold two, the, the problem of uh, folding is solved in some way? Pretty much, yeah. And that's a big thing. Why is that a big thing that you know, folding proteins is, is potentially solved now? Yeah, may maybe solved is a it's a bit of an overstatement, but but it's it's very good. Yeah, but it's for drug design, for instance. Yes. It's it's very very useful for pharma companies to to know like yeah, this is the shape. Then we can fit. I mean, usually these drugs and and their targets are like a lock and key. You mm -hmm. have to fit like a, a lock to a key, and of course it's. But it, I mean, think mm -hmm. of, of, of think of the. You have a, a machine in every cell in your body that can generate an infinite amount of possibilities. Mm. And, you, and I can send an email to a company today and get that protein tomorrow and, and put it into a bacteria. So it, the, yeah. the, if, if you think of the process of, of developing drugs, right, mm. it's a 10-year process, mm. and you need to manufacture these small chemicals and, and it takes years to, to do that. Right. If I, if I can put into alpha fold the sequence and they, then they will tell me it will fold like this and therefore it will have this effect, you can basically make uh, a, a million different drugs in a week. I see. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. So basically, if you just, you know, given the sequence, you will know the 3D structure. Yeah. And in that way, you know the function of the drug. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you can and and if you know the the the, the shape of the of the proteins in in the body, then mm. you can try to approximate how they're going to interact. That part is um. still it's still mm. a, a bigger problem, right? Okay. The interaction between those two things, but it, it took us like one step much closer to that. But I but see. but not only so given, given that you know the protein you want to treat in some way mm. in the body, and you know the structure of that, then you can try to design drugs given the sequence, and then you know the structure of that that should match. Yeah, I mean, and this body. is one application. But I mean, it has applications in 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 uh, in uh, agriculture, in chemical engineering, in 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 production, in manufacturing. I mean, cells can produce an infinite amount of. Uh, chemicals or of, 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 of building blocks that you can use to make plastics, to make enzymes, to make whatever you want. But we need to understand the shape before we can design this, but, uh, these machines. But, but, but maybe, uh, sorry, please, no, maybe please. another perspective is that, I mean, these companies and researchers want to determine these structures, but so far they have had to use X-ray crystallography. Yeah. And that takes time and it's expensive and so on. So if you could just get it as a prediction from a model, that's like... I mean, takes time is an understatement. It takes <laughs> years and, and it's a grotesque, horrible... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it was the same thing with sequencing. Like when I started my, 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 uh, my um, uh, master's, my teacher was like, okay, that thing that you can sequence in a day, it took me my entire PhD 
like yeah. four years yeah. to uh, yeah, of working like a maniac to arrive to one single viral genome. And now you can do it in a USB stick for $50, you know. So I mean, it really makes it sense what is said. <laughs> yeah. The Moore's law, but in bioinformatics, you have the exponential of Moore's law, yeah. more or less. Both the sequencing part has it reduced, you know, s to, to a minuscule of the original time. Mm. But so has the folding then, I guess, of that as well. So now the folding has taken a, a, a huge yeah. leap but forward. So but but let, let, let's, let's take a, a, a business or a macro perspective of what we are talking about mm. here and, and, and how the impact AI can have uh, on society. And I think this is still... If you're not deep into these topics and if you're not truly understanding how huge this example is, right? Mm -hmm. So here we are talking about we, we having we have not incrementally improved the process. No, no, we have completely reinvented it and thousand x mm -hmm. its efficiency. Yeah, and 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 here we have done it in a very very low uh, application. You know very down into a, a use case that you now can apply. So you can have, you have thousand x efficiency around protein and, uh, and folding that we now can take into many different industries and different types of problems, mm -hmm. theoretically. Yeah. yeah. So, so AI now has, is this general purpose tech. And when we are starting to really understand how deep it can really reinvent the process, I, I think there's, there are still many people who are sort of stuck in, you know, working in normal businesses and, you know, doing AI, no, BI and reporting and a little bit of analytics and still having a hard time connecting with, the, with this potential. And I think these kind of examples shows that, you know, there will be more examples like this and more and more and more if I, if I extend this over the next 10 years. You know, when I tell uh, customers, when I approach them uh, with both things like BERT and uh, GPT-3, well, not GPT-3, but <laughs> GPT-2 and, uh, and uh, the, other, the other things that, that you can uh, use for free is, you know, there's, there's this crazy company that invested millions and millions and millions of dollars to create this ridiculously good uh, tool and they gave it for free. <laughs> And you have to, to invest zero dollars to use it. You can just download, click and download. And that can, can throw your business forward 10x. Mm. And if you don't want to use it, your competition is. So what's it going to be? <laughs> <laughs> Costa Rica negotiations. <laughs> Sign here. <laughs> no, but, but, but that, do they get it? I mean, like, do we get it? I mean, like, I, it's I'm It's so working. crazy that it, it, because, I mean, why would a company give for free something that is so expensive and so valuable? Why did DeepMind give this for free? Yeah. Uh, you know, why did Google uh, uh, give uh, these things for free? Uh, Facebook, fair, Facebook, everybody. Yeah. Why are they throwing away these things? Uh, to, to when they could charge, I mean, remember the IBM, the IBM module is they build like a, a really, really fancy technology and charge a lot of money to use it. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. These guys are just giving these things for free. It, it, so now we're referring insane? to the whole open source topic and how how we really build AI models now exactly. with, with with our well, but open, open source, source, source open source is made by a bunch of people, not by a company. Yeah, right? yeah that's I mean, true. That's but this true. is a company that spent, that spent billions of dollars in developing these things and then just give it zero away. But there's so many tangents here. Crazy. Um, but we, there's so many tangents here because. If I go into the enterprise, I mean, like you meet these uh, as, as, as clients, right? Mm -hmm. And to really make the sort of transition from business application landscape, software licensing into how do we work with analytics? Well, you don't, you don't build it. You use these PyTorch frameworks or, or TensorFlow frameworks and how we build, how we build systems and code. It's, I, I find it what, what you've been experiencing and what you've been working on in you know, in Spotify and stuff like that, it, it is still very, very far away from the traditional enterprise business application landscape and IT CIO ex experience. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know? I think it just moves too fast now. Yeah, it's 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 yeah and I, I think it's also like you alluded to earlier, it's, it's often a data problem. Like they don't really have the yeah. means to get all of their data out. It's like in different places and... Yeah. There's one database here and one Excel sheet yeah. here and so on. 
But it's exciting to see simply that AI can help with problems that traditionally you thought you had to have like a lot of manual, you know, hardcore scientists to solve and suddenly you can take like a data approach to solve something in a different way. Uh, are you excited about you know, AI for science in the future? Do you think AI can help with other like scientific problems that we have, like climate change or energy production or whatnot? Do you see the DeepMind thing for controlling a fusion re re reactor, by the way? Uh, no, I haven't, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, but d definitely, um, definitely there is, there is potential mm. for, for all of that and for science. And I mean, ev even in biology, there's things like, you know, CRISPR, you can, you know, the, the CRISPR technology, mm. you can change mm. you know, maybe plant sequences and... <laughs> and uh, improve crop yields and, and things like this. I don't know, maybe you have m more um, ideas about the climate. climate I mean, part. imagine it building, like let's solve climate change. Mm. Let's build a, a bacteria that produces hydrogen, which already exists in, in <laughs> nature, right? Mm. Uh, let's have a bacteria that eats plastic and, pro uh, and produces uh, uh, hydrogen. Yeah. That exists, that, that, is, that is there, it just, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't produce enough, but if we can fold enough uh, and if we can put enough CPU process, maybe we can come out with a with a proper the bacteria that farts hydrogen every every three <laughs> seconds, right? Instead and then of cows instead farting of methane, methane, methane. methane, right? But I mean, that's what. But the, 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 this is crazy what life can do, yeah. and now we have the the code. We used to have the code, but now we know how that code is going to look like once it comes out of the business end. Uh -huh. So. I think that that uh, huge potential, huge potential for manuf. I mean, I think that uh, people are focused a lot in in health because I mean that's the traditional money maker of biology. Yeah. But the applications in in manufacturing yeah. uh, and new materials. I mean, some of the strongest uh, materials known to man are made by bacteria. And and animals, right? But is so there a combination of biology and AI together here? Because it's, it's this data dimension in this that is also needed now in order to design this. Or, uh, because I see that as part of it that's truly accelerating this now, because we have, we've been experimenting with all this, but now when we can do like the, the sequencing of protein and, and all this stuff, mm. so the data part together with how we want to use biology, uh, isn't, isn't I mean, that very exciting? It's very exciting, but I mean, none of this would matter if you didn't have. Uh, it's it's a it's a trifecta, okay. right? It's we now now have limitless computing. Compute. I compute, mean, yeah. compute limitless cloud computing. That I cannot understress. Like nothing that we're talking about here works if, if you, you don't, don't have, have GPUs, right? And so so first you need. Okay, we need to get rid of all the Bitcoin miners that are taking over the, <laughs> our GPUs, for God's sake, stop doing that. But I mean, if we can put those billions of dollars in GPUs to proper use, we could maybe end climate change. Because now we have, we have the sequence, we have the folding, and we have the AI to put all, all this together. So, yeah, I mean... That's such an awesome th thought. Let's move now, you know, given the, the time as well, to, to some more societal, philosophical kind of topics, I, I would argue. And, but still, let's try to keep a bit into the bio, bio, biological kind of, kind of topic. So uh, how about this question? Um, how would you compare or what are the main differences between an artificial neural network and a biological neural network? And Mm. And I would let you to, to think a bit about that, and I can start a bit by giving a couple of my own like thinkings here, and mm. then you, as experts of the bio biology Shooting area, <laughs> can can disagree or you know add to that. But obviously, one of obvious difference is uh, generality, and and you know, deep neural networks today is very narrow, and they can you know work on on very narrow specific tasks, but it's getting better and getting more and more multitask kind of models, uh, including GPT-3 and, and whatnot. Another is high-level reasoning then, potentially. You know, today it's very like perception-based, you know, trying to take an image or a text or something and get some kind of representation on that. But to have this kind of high-level reasoning is not something that we have nice tools to do, potentially. 
you could disagree and say that Tesla and, and the autopilot and the full self driving, you know, have both the perception but also some kind of reasoning on top of it to make some kind of action in how to operate in the world. So there are some stuff, but since in general, I would argue that the high level reasoning is not really there yet. And a reason for that, I would also argue, is the 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 statelessness, so to speak, of deep learning networks. You basically feed forward some kind of data through it and you get some prediction, but it doesn't change the state. You don't have a world model that continuously is operating. But there are exceptions. Reinforcement learning, of course, is one. Tesla, once again, how they you know, change the state that they have. But in general, there is a big difference, I would argue, that the, that the brain is, is very much both a state and a compute. And that is also my, okay, perhaps final, final I can continue, but <laughs> another final point potentially is the difference in how you train neural networks today, which is very batch oriented. So you send a lot of data through it and then at some point you say, okay, now I'm going to deploy it and, and you use inference. But during inference time, you don't change the model uh, at that same time. But there are stuff like neuromorphic computing and whatnot that is potentially going to change that as well. Okay, so these are just some initial thoughts, you know. But given that, what do you think the main differences between the human brain and current AI systems are? Anyone wants to yeah, start? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I can, I can start. I mean, those are very good points. Um, also, brains are more plastic. Yes, like, that's actually my fifth point <laughs> that I didn't want to. But what is I'm plastic? So, I'm so happy yeah, that you so mentioned that. So they can they can grow new connections or like old connections die out. Like most prominently at, at the beginning of your life, when when you're a baby, you have like yeah, uh, yeah you you have connections everywhere, and then they sort of get get pruned out. That's also, I mean, exactly my fifth point there, you can see as well. <laughs> but I, I think, you know... To I, I, I know you put it in now. <laughs> no, I, but anyway, you know, you have to manually program the architecture yeah. of today's AI system. And that's a big problem. The yeah. brain doesn't work like that. It's not only, like, genetically programmed. It actually is learning that through experience, how the connections in the brain works, right? And yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, the thing that you said before is, is very important with this online mm. thing. Like w we are always taking in input. There is no like uh, Batch. Uh, like <laughs> supervised learning in that way. I mean, maybe in some cases, but it's not like here is the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, w we just take in this stream of input and, and make sense of it somehow. Mm. And then... Um, uh, I mean, it's interesting to think about backpropagation. Like as as far as we know, so neural networks are trained with this backpropagation, right? Back artificial neural networks. Yeah, oh, yeah, artificial neural <laughs> networks, backpropagation of error. But it's not really. I mean, there are theories that something like that could be happening in the brain, but it's not something that we know that mm. it exists, and it's. But how does the neuron work then? I mean, in some case, you have some connections through other neurons. You have the dendrites and some kind of synapses as, as well, and they get some input to a neuron. And, and when that input goes above a certain threshold, some kind of action potential is happening, right? Yeah. And that can cause the change of a state of the neuron in some way. Or, or how would you describe how a biological neu neuron works? Yeah, so as you said, um, a biological neuron receives a lot of inputs to their dendrites and each input, uh, and, uh, yeah, these inputs are action potentials from other neurons mm. and then they, they change the voltage a little bit and uh, there is also like uh, some other things like uh, calcium concentrations <laughs> and stuff like that. but. When the voltage reaches a, a certain threshold, you get like an event which is called an action potential where the voltage goes up from like minus 80 millivolt to plus 50 millivolt. Mm -hmm. And then that gets sent out through the axon, which is like the, the big fat thing that <laughs> <laughs> communicates with, with other neurons. Mm -hmm. So it, it's usually referred to as like an all or none event. Yeah. Like a kind of it's a like a transistor in some way, but a yeah. bit more analog, I guess. But still, it, it has some kind of either on or off kind of state, right? Yeah. But and, and I would say that 
that's for me that's the difference mm. because i don't think it's entirely uh, so one thing that bothers me about the the the, the most of the architectures in in, in in neural networks is the plane thing you have layers mm. brain doesn't have layers no it's uh, a it's a continuity of of processing right and uh, the other thing that you never take into account is that i mean uh, so the the signal correct me if i'm wrong uh, michael but the signal from one neuron to the other is really slow this is not the speed of light no this is not a, an electric voltage thing you don't have like it's current kilo, kilohertz or something instead it's, of it's really slow so if you have a very long uh, neuron because there there's long nerves that signal is going to take longer and it's going to to affect things at a different time than the ones that are closer so, so that dynamics in the bio that dynamics is, is never captured yeah. in in neural networks yeah. there's no way mm. to put delays between layers and yeah. well i mean first the layer type of thing that is like everybody in the same layer gets corrected at the same time that's mm. not how the brain works it's way more complicated yeah. and you have modules and like i said it, it has like different parts of the brain are are have a very different architecture and if you think about it i mean all the brains are pretty much the same somehow they developed into the same way that's not by uh, the fact that you have the visual cortex and different uh, centers in the same places it's not a random choice i mean not uh, everybody has the these centers in the same place and they usually have that same kind of uh, connectivity and i think that that's by design mm. that's that's why we develop these things it, it, that's a weird thing about biology that that that, that we never uh, understand that that the shape is the function that's what defines right, the function right. oh, yeah. and i think that that is missing from the neural networks is is it uh, is these these sections and that's another I, t-shirt by the way shape, shape is, is a function, function. The shape <laughs> is a function. that's a cool t-shirt because i mean I, i'm thinking like uh, the other day i was looking at this thing that the mystic chips that this uh, analog neural network mm. chips right okay. uh, and uh, and i was thinking yeah i mean maybe this whole thing about general ai and this never ending search for the quadrillion parameter gpt model or whatever maybe we're looking at it the wrong way maybe i mean you can't go to the moon on a steam engine mm. so maybe we have the wrong uh, we, we i mean they're the good architecture yeah, the poor architecture maybe yeah you can do you can predict what is a cat and what is a dog but maybe we can't deliver a general ai on on this binary approximation uh, of of neural net of of what the brain does do, do mean, you believe in, in neuromorphic computing if you heard about that field or yeah i mean not for a while but yeah yeah i mean in short i mean it is trying to instead of having the von neumann architecture that mm -hmm. computers of today have had for the last 70 years you know mm -hmm. with the cpu in one place and the memory in the other and the memory can't really do any compute it can only handle state and the the cpu can't handle state only compute mm -hmm. then you have to transfer the data back and forth all the time to do both compute and, and memory um, but the neuromorphic I is really trying to do what the brain is doing you have mm -hmm. a, in a single neuron so to speak both the compute and the state mm -hmm. and perhaps that's one move forward it's called memristors this kind of you know didn't ibm were trying to create artificial neurons yeah, I think a so. chip like yeah. there was in a chip. I wonder what that. Yeah, I am research. Because this yeah. this mystic guys they were doing the the these chips that uh, they were analog compu I mean mm. it's analog computing. Yeah. yeah. So I mean I think neuromorphic is a bit analog as well. Mm. So. Anyway, um let's try to have okay, one final question then. Um <laughs> when <laughs> sorry for this question <laughs> <laughs> you know what's, what's going to be when do we have agi <laughs> how do we know how do you know we don't have it now? <laughs> ah, <laughs> what is AGI? what do you think is making all the anti-vaxxers but okay do you believe in you know kurzweil says like in, uh, in 2029 he believes that will be a point others say like uh, Michio Kaka says, mm. like 100 years from now, a lot of people in the middle. Um, do you have any sense, you know, of, of the time scale? The 10 years, 100 years. Yeah, not 2029, uh, I don't think. 
But when? <laughs> but I think it sti- also go back, goes back to the definition of AGI then. Because I, I, I asked, someone asked me that question and defining the singularity. And there are some sharp definitions of it, but I, I, I have a hard time understanding it. So I think even when I'm talking to you, we say, I, oh, human-like intelligence. Yeah, oh, I hate that. Oh, don't, say that. that. <laughs> don't say that I said that. <laughs> no, no, no. I was like, someone said that, oh, come on, come on. then you get the second rant from it. But uh, I mean, <laughs> if there's so many levels before AGI that we have to survive. Yeah. I mean, yes. we, we, we need to survive the, the, uh, the, uh, the robot that can fold, <laughs> that, can, that can make exactly. a t-shirt. We need to survive the robot that can drive a car. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that is a very good point. And you know I said this. And narrow AI exactly. is more dangerous. I'm more afraid about narrow age, uh, AI. Going you rogue. Know, using, for example, in these times, you know, for drones or missiles that, you know, go rogue in some way and they're completely autonomous and they have no sense of... Yeah, okay, we, we shouldn't go here too long, but I think, you know... <laughs> no, but I was talking about the AI that uh, basically will destroy millions of jobs and uh, in, in, in manufacturing, in uh, transportation. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that technology exists today. It's just that it's still cheaper to hire somebody to do those jobs mm-hmm. than to make a robot that makes them. But I mean, Tesla is about to really destroy. Uh, if you look at the number of people that live from driving a taxi or yeah. transporting goods. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Now, we it's need like to survive that first US. before the, the... I don't think the general AI will have anything left to destroy. <laughs> <laughs> you think the, 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 the ripples on the economy... On the economy is going will, to be... Uh, and, 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 but you I'm can still an optimist here. I think you know, it will... Maybe it creates new jobs and all this. And perhaps we don't need to work as much as well in the future. We can mm. still, right? Yeah, yeah, we still we're still in this basic um, income in some way. Still in this forty-hour work week, even yeah. though what was it Why? Bertrand Russell who, or exactly. someone said we would work fifteen hours a week. I mean, the, the the Indians in Costa Rica used to work two hours a day to pick up fruit and stuff. And that's all. <laughs> the rest of the day, they would just randomly pick things from the forest and try to get high on them. So <laughs> I don't know. I don't see progress. <laughs> Back to basics. <laughs> Back to basics. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Are you optimistic or, neg- or more pessimistic about like 10 plus years ahead that we will have a better society or worse society when it comes to you know, technological you know, advances? Well, when it comes to technological um, advances, like AI, I'm basically, maybe yeah. uh, optimistic, but I think there are many other things where I'm not so yes. optimistic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but do you yeah. think AI will be used more for good than for bad? <laughs> Um, wow. I mean, <laughs> I, can, I can say that uh, nuclear uh, technologies were used. I mean, that can really be bad. Yeah. And so far, up to today, it has, right. it has been used mostly for, I mean, most of the uranium that has been yeah. produced has been to power. Exactly. And, and so the, we and were able to control that I mean, potential right. danger. That I don't know if you know, but problem. most of the energy from nuclear plants come from decommissioned missile bombs. Really? Yeah, I, they, they, I mean, the, 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 they're using the, the bombs to, the, there's a ton of bombs that go out of, uh, the, they're obsolete, and yeah. they use the uranium from those bombs to power homes. Mm. So, I, I mean, if, if we didn't use that to destroy ourselves, yeah, maybe, maybe we won't use AI for <laughs> destroying <laughs> anybody. I, I shared this paper yesterday. Did, did you read it about the toxicity prediction? Oh, yeah, yeah where there was this uh, pharmaceutical company that released a tool where you could, you know, make a molecule less toxic with their AI model. Uh-huh. But then they realized that, oh, oh, damn, like you can also use it to make it more <laughs> toxic. <laughs> <laughs> so then they tried to like, oh, let's yeah. try to make it more toxic. And then they ended up with some like real poisons that that already exist and some new novel poisons that might be even worse. <laughs> I mean, AI is a GPT. It's, it's really a general purpose technology that can be used for, for both good and bad. That's, that's yeah, but the sad truth. Well, I, I've, I think that 99.99% of all humans are decent human beings yes. that are trying to do good. It's the 0.01% that we need to get rid of. <laughs> exactly. that's, that's the one that, that's why we can't have nice things, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Well said. 99% plus is are good people mm. and uh, they, they want the best for everyone. 
I think we should uh, end here, or do you have any? I think uh, we're probably running a little bit on overtime, <laughs> yes. so uh, our producer is uh, spinning Roll. his, uh, rolling his fingers. <laughs> so, <laughs> Michael, what's next in your life? What's happening professionally, privately, uh, <laughs> coming weeks, months? <laughs> um, no, uh, my my current plan is just to to continue. <laughs> I, I I don't have any any. Um, uh, special plans just see see where this goes see how much we can grow the company and um, and, and potentially spin out some fun cool products stuff. maybe mm. <laughs> mm. Uh, cool. and buy the lambo <laughs> 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 now let me tell you about nfts no <laughs> <laughs> after NFTs. after work we can do this work. <laughs> alex what's happening in your life do you have any uh, coming interesting Things going on. Well, I'm going to learn Swedish this year. <laughs> ah, you said that for 20 years, right? Yeah. I don't I, I, no, no, 14. 14. 14. 14. 14 so. and, and, but the joke was, uh, when you're not having so busy with projects, yeah, exactly. you will learn Swedish. Whenever we have a downtime, then I'll be... I'll, I'll no Swedish. downtime. No downtime. No, this year, uh, I'm, I'm a big uh, a fan of uh, the electric car revolution. That's another thing we have that's to, that's to... We should we should speak about yeah. that soon. After, after, after work. work. Uh, yeah. th these guys they are tired of me talking <laughs> about, you know, like <laughs> Chinese battery stocks and uh, <laughs> this type of thing. But um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to learning Swedish, getting my driver license and maybe buying a car. Well, and well, and then need an a driver electric license. Electric you can just drive, you know, with autopilot. <laughs> No, that's a little so bit So by the start to point, you're getting a license to get a car, to get an electrical car. It, just to get an electrical car. That's yeah. the, so you never cared about this before, but now... No, I, been, I, I, I mean, I, so I used to spend an, an hour and a half to drive 12 kilometers oh. to go to my office yeah. and an hour and a half to go back to my house, 12 okay. kilometers, every day for 12 years. In... In Costa Rica. Tra yeah, traffic. And the traffic, traffic is just horrible. Oh. Mm. And uh, so when I came to Sweden, I said, like, I'm never going to have a car again. But I've never driven an electric car. And mm. uh, they seem fun. So yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it, I'm, I'm super excited about the, the whole uh, getting rid of uh, gasoline cars. That, yeah, I want, I want to buy one. Yeah, support the cause. Yeah. Be part of the cause because, yeah. because yeah. of this movement. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Nice. Michael, anyone that you would recommend to have on this podcast? Someone that you would like to listen to uh, when we interrogate them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have a couple. I mean, if, if, if you want even more biology, yeah. uh, you should interview uh, Emma Lundberg from uh, KTH SciLife Lab, who has yeah. done some really cool work on like... Uh, Caglifying research and also turning it oh, into cool. into uh, games like uh, uh, online games. Um, if, if you want to, I mean, I don't know exactly who you've had in the past, but no, you, you could also invite um, Rebecca Rydor Lötman, who is a, a good investor in this space, who has invested in a couple of interesting companies in both AI and um, and biology mm. or um, maybe Oscar Tekström who was involved in in some of the first research on attention uh, oh, really yeah google research Swedish so, um, one or? yeah huh? he lives in stockholm so some suggestions yeah that sounds <laughs> awesome it's awesome suggestion <laughs> super Alex, cool do you have any ideas Ah, I'm not as well connected as Michael, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. So I don't know how good uh, leads I can I, I can provide, but I would strongly. I, I feel like there's a couple of Teslas in the uh, biotech in, in the in the bio world uh, right now. So and really, uh, yes, people that are going to take this alpha fold and and build one of these uh, world changing devices. Yeah. And uh, I wish you find one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so many topics that we thought we would go you know, go to cover, but we, we spoke about completely other stuff. But we still have an after after work to to continue yeah. exploring so those topics. So Nikhil Hus and uh, Alex, it's been a true pleasure to have you here. 
And uh, let's now Thank continue you. for the after after work and uh, wish you the best in your future career. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>